How's everybody going? My name is Christian Wagner and I'm the Militant Thomist. And tonight I'm with Dr. Robertson Janis and I'm with the Byzantine Scotist. And we will be talking about heliocentrism a bit. But before that, I have, uh, rather than doing my normal thing where I try to think of everything I'm doing, I made a little bit of, uh, I just made an ad. So, so that'll play and we'll be on talking about geocentrism in about 30 seconds. Thank you. Join my Patreon at patreon.com slash militantomist. You get access to more articles and videos. And if you'd like to help in another way, buy a Militant Thomist mug. Lastly, you can buy a book from Militant Thomist Press. See options below. Also, if you prefer audio, check us out on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Join the Discord to get involved. And if you're a patron, you get access to other Discord channels. Also, destroy that like and subscribe button and comment to annihilate that algorithm. Lastly, this show is brought to you by Fluent Greek. I'm sure you've forgotten your seminary Greek and need to get it back or just want to learn Greek to read sacred scripture in its original language. That's why Fluent Greek is here. Using modern pedagogical techniques, it is set it up so that you are reading Greek from the very beginning and learn Greek how you're supposed to learn it. Through reading Greek. It sorts the New Testament by verse from easiest to hardest and then gives space repetition of these verses so that you can read Greek as soon as possible. Even better, it is only 15 bucks a month to use. But if you use the code militant, you can get 20% off and help the show. Go to fluentgreek.com to learn more. And the link is in the description. Thank you. So uh, we will be, yes. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? That's the fastest commercial I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, I, I made sure, I put it on one time speed and it was like a minute and 20 seconds. And I was like, you know, everybody's going to hate sitting through a minute and 20 seconds of that. If they need to know it, they'll, they'll listen. They'll, it'll hit them. So I just put that baby on one and a half speed. The people in the replay hit, hitting it at uh, two times speed, they'll have a fun time with the, the ad. <laughs> so how are you two doing tonight? Uh, this will be more of a loose style for, for everybody that's watching. We'll just be going back and forth talking. Well, I'm doing good. Yeah. I can't complain. There you go. The Lord's yeah, been good. Well. So your Lent spin good start to uh to the holy fast yeah no yeah although i'm past that age where i have to fast as much as you guys do so you know i'm, I'm privileged <laughs> so I, can't, I can't speak from that much experience but i know i'm, I'm really I to do, I'm, doing. <laughs> I'm really i'm really happy about the uh the the 1962 uh two revisions when it comes to the uh the rules of fasting i like to have at least one meal of of meat every day that that makes it a lot easier but fasting shouldn't be easy well so you're still a, you're still a growing boy you need that meat. i i know i know yeah. so uh it, so I, I have to say it's a lot good. better doing it now living on my own versus college where there's and you'd expect with all these like vegans today and stuff there'd be plenty of good like non-meat options but no there's still nothing good on college campuses Oh yeah, and you're you're Eastern, it, you're Eastern you're too. Eastern, so. Or, yeah, so it's you know there was a good spot that had like an avocado sandwich at my campus, but the problem was I had to walk by the Chick Fil A every day to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I, I'm thinking what we'll do is because this is a very a lot a lot of people are gonna see this, and and just like I mentioned to Gideon about uh, young Earth creationism, it can seem a little kooky. What well, go going into it? So, uh, Doctor Sinjanis, you're you're the uh, the brightest bulb of us three. So, do you want to um, do you want to just give us an overview of how the heck somebody in 2022 could even entertain the fact that the Earth is the center of the solar system? You wanna <laughs> you wanna go ahead? How long how long do you want me to talk on that? Uh, probably like... five ten minutes. Just a very brief overview, and five, then we'll then we'll get back okay. and forth about about proofs and stuff like that mm -hmm. and evidences. But more like the the quidsit of uh of, of the thing yeah well um i'll tell you how it happened to me and it's a kind of a unique story but it it, it will make sense um i was home one sunday afternoon had nothing to do this was how many years ago 20 years ago when i was a young boy um i had nothing to do so i went on the internet and just happened to be futzing around, you know, doing searches here and there. And I came across this PhD in astronomy who was saying that the Earth was in the center of the universe and not moving. So I said, well, that's interesting. So I had to make a decision whether I was going to press the next button on my keyboard to get into his website or go out and play basketball that Sunday because it was a nice day. And I decided to press the key and got into his website and started reading. And within a few minutes, I could see this guy knew, knew what he was talking about because he knew the physics of the universe. And I had I was a physics major in college 
when I first started college, and then I switched to theology later on. I graduated with a theology degree, but I knew the physics he was talking about, and I and I could see that you know he was making sense. So after that, I just kept reading, and you know, for weeks on end, because I just said, if this is true, then the Catholic Church was right, and Galileo was wrong, and. If that's the case, then all this chatter that we've heard for the last four centuries about, well, the Catholic Church made a big mistake with Galileo, and then that begs the question, what other mistakes has she made? Okay, If she stuck her nose in a place where she shouldn't have been, you know, dealing with science, um, where else has she stuck her nose and, and given us wrong decisions? And I'm not making this up. The Galileo historians have said this in their books, that the church was wrong about Galileo. What a, well, here's I can give you a whole list of what they think the church did wrong, like contraception, you know, against contraception, against homosexuality, against this, that, and the other thing. Okay, so this is a big deal. This is not just about geocentrism. This is about the credibility of the Catholic Church, because she put her full weight against Galileo with two different popes declaring that heliocentrism or Copernicanism was a formal heresy in 1616. Okay, and then you have the next pope, Urban VIII, who reiterated the whole thing that was going on in 1616, and he said, yes, Galileo was vehemently suspect of heresy for writing this book, trying to defend heliocentrism. And the only reason he was suspect of heresy and not charged and convicted of formal heresy was because they didn't really know whether Galileo himself believed what he wrote, because sometimes he wrote it hypothetically, you know, and so the church was lenient and, and Urban VIII used to be Cardinal Barberini and a very good friend of Galileo's back in the um, early 1620s. So, you know, that may have been the reason he's more lenient on him, but still, he was con he was convicted of being a suspect of heresy. Now, heresy, if he was convicted of sus being suspect of heresy, what does that mean? Well, that means that somebody before the 1633 trial had declared that, that heliocentrism or Copernicanism was a formal heresy. <laughs> Because Pope Urban just couldn't make it up and say, oh, well, I think, uh, you know, heliocentrism is a form of heresy. Therefore, Galileo, I'm going to convict you. That's not the way it happened. In 1616, uh, Paul V had organized 11 cardinals called the qualifiers who went in to examine this whole issue. And they came out with the opinion that heliocentrism was a formal heresy. And they wrote it down gave it to Cardinal Bellarmine, and Bellarmine gave it to Paul V. And both Bellarmine and Paul V confirmed it, what the, what the qualifiers had said. And these were all Dominican qualifiers. They knew what they were doing. And so that's where it came from. That's where the church first declared uh, heliocentrism, or anything that makes the earth move, you can put it that way, a heresy. OK, so that's what Pope Ur uh, Urban VIII was going on in 1633. So, I mean, like I'm saying, this is a big issue because if if the church was wrong, then, yeah, let's attack the Catholic Church because she was first wrong and sticking her nose where she shouldn't have been. And second of all, she was wrong about how she judged the issue. So if that's the case what's the Catholic Church doing claiming that she's infallible, that she that she can give us, you know, the right or wrong of everything that we do? I mean, come on, we can start penetrating into the church and figure out where those areas are that she really has no authority. So um, I knew this was a big thing. So I'm glad I pressed that button on my keyboard that Sunday afternoon uh, because that started me on a trek where I was going to get down to the nitty gritty of this subject as far and as deep and as wide as I could go to find out what the truth was. So there were four areas, basically. There was scripture, and scripture's replete with information on this subject. There was the fathers, 
And the fathers were unanimous in their belief of geocentrism. There wasn't one exception. Okay. And it wasn't in a vacuum either. They were fighting against the Greeks that were promoting some type of heliocentrism. They had various views, but still. But Did you Dr. Want to say yeah, I wanted to ask you on that one clarifying question, which is that did do you think the fathers held this on the basis that the faith taught on um, geocentrism, or do you think they held it on the basis that it was sort of the common view at the time that everyone agreed, or at least most people agreed Ptolemy was correct, so they followed him? Uh, no, because the Greeks were divided. They had some heliocentrists, some geocentrists. Ptolemy was a Greek, mm -hmm. and he sided with the geocentric. But um, Pythagoras, as far back as 600 BC, was a heliocentrist, and then so was Aristarchus in 300 BC. Mm -hmm. So they had a long line of heliocentrists. So they were divided, and the fathers basically said not it wasn't wasn't based on a church belief per se but it was based on their consensus on how you interpret scripture and you take scripture at face value if it says the earth doesn't move then the earth doesn't move and there's no there was no question about that they were as resolute on that hermeneutic as they were about interpreting matthew 26 26 which said this is my body take and eat they didn't know what the heck transubstantiation was. They had no idea. But they knew what Jesus said, and they said, okay, that's the truth. And so we're going to build our whole theology around that truth because Jesus said it. So that's how they regarded the Bible when they read it. Literally comes to us, and that's how we interpret it. You want me to go on anymore, uh, Christian? Or oh, oh no, no, no. That's that's a good uh, kind of introduction to the to the, to the arguments at hand. So, Gideon, what is what is your kind of take? Because I know you're a little bit more more reserved than uh, Doctor yeah. Genesis. is. Yeah. So maybe I can give my few thoughts on it. It's my first. I mean. I'm more inclined towards the geocentrist position than the heliocentrist position, just to be clear when I'm putting out these few concerns I have. But my few concerns is, first of all, it does seem to me, when I've investigated a lot more the church father's views on the age of the world, and it seems to me extremely clear that over and over again, they say that this is a matter of faith because it's a matter of the interpretation of scripture. And this is clear because they always invoke it on the basis of scripture and frequently against um, the common consensus of the time. So in my opening statement, for example, with Jimmy Aiken, I went through a whole passage with, um, who is it? of St. Augustine and went through a St. Augustine is well aware that the Greeks and the Egyptians have records that seem to contradict the Bible. And he, he does poke holes in them, but his primary reason for rejecting them is the authority of scripture. And I've pushed this forward a number of times that people who want to say the church fathers are only young earthers because they didn't have reason to believe otherwise. No, they say they have reasons to believe otherwise. Augustine was well aware of the problem of how many animals could fit on the ark and addresses this issue in City of God. And he cites Origen. And his origin is like sort of the people the liberal always cite. Origen himself <laughs> in, cult in Contra Celsum explains how all the animals can fit on the ark and tries to do the math to figure it out. Um, now, of course, we have much better numbers on this nowadays. We know much more about the number of species. We've been able to categorize species in the created kind. But really what these creationist scientists are doing is just a more detailed version of what Origen was already doing. Um, but when it comes to something like the four elements, let's say, it does seem when the fathers discuss the four elements, this is something they're discussing as a contemporary scientific theory, as in they think that this seems to make sense with reason, and like St. Basil, for example, in his Hexameron, he seems to think that there's certain passages in scripture which might seem to suggest the four elements, but it seems more that he's taking his reason and applying it to interpret it there. And now my big question is, and the thing I'm very uncertain, I go back and forth on it, is which category does geocentrism seem to fall into? Because it does seem sometimes the fathers are invoking this on the basis of reason, and other times, as you were pointing out, Dr. Syngenis, on the basis of scripture. And for one class I took in college, actually, I had to read uh, Galileo and Bellarmine's letters, not technically back and forth, but really back and forth. Um, they were just publishing these. 
And it does seem that Bellarmine is concerned with the what the scriptures say on this matter. But I do remember at another spot, Bellarmine saying that it does seem like if the weight of reason was against it, like we could perhaps go the other direction. But he doesn't seem inclined to. Uh, and Bellarmine seems to suggest, it's been a few years since I looked into this, so I'm pulling it off memory, that mo he seems to suggest somewhat that motion is relative. And so Galileo at best can come up with a mathematical model for how things move. But in terms of when we're speaking of the center of the world, it seems Bellarmine thinks this can only be resolved philosophically. And now when it comes to the philosophy, I think the geocentrists have a significant leg up in the philosophy side. And I would say this is because of the movement of the heavenly spheres. It does seem that the traditional philosophy of many of the scholastics, the movement of the heavenly spheres was important to how they saw the cosmos. And so perhaps reviving geocentrism could help to bring back an idea of the cosmos as musical. I'm right now with some seventh and eighth graders going through um, a poem in Merchant of Venice where um, Lorenzo is trying to calm Jessica because Jessica is very worried. And he has this whole poem where he in, uh, invites Jessica to look up at the heavens and see how they're moving in this musical fashion. And she needs to open up her soul to the music of the cosmos. And it seems that in scripture, we frequently see these images of God singing, not only saying the world into existence, but sort of singing it into existence. And it does seem that this musical view of the cosmos is important. So I know that's a bunch of scattered thoughts. That's where I my thoughts are at. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the most important thing you you said, and then my background is, <clears throat> I I'm still I'm still not completely sold, but I definitely do lean towards <laughs> uh, geocentrism because of what you said about relative motion is from the very idea of relative motion. In order to um, in order to have a solid pinpoint of a center of a thing, it 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 all matters based on the uh, the sphere of reference in which you are you're basing yourself off of. And theologically and philosophically, when it comes to uh, the the center of activity of God's activity in the universe, it would it would be most fitting in order to, for us to um, in order for us to designate the earth as the center of the universe and to base our models off of that and to make the sun the center of our universe would seem to be atheistic and to have the purpose of to uh, philosophically and theologically take our minds off of uh, God's center of creativity and rather to have a separate center um, yeah. uh, for, for the universe. I will say just one other concern I had about geocentrism is it does seem to me well, within the solar system, you can debate what's moving around what. It does seem that within the galaxy as a whole, as I understand it, I this is the issue is Jimmy Aiken during the debate partly went after me on um, astronomy. And this is an area I'm much weaker and I focused much more on issues like geology and biology and so on. But um, one thing that immediately comes to mind is it does seem that the solar system, from what I understand, is rotating around the center of the galaxy. So is it more that the Milky Way galaxy itself as a whole is rotating around the Earth? And that's where maybe some concerns come to mind, but I, it perhaps could just be that I don't understand the issues present here. Go ahead, well, let, me, let me see if I can help you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Milky Way. Let, let's we First of all, we don't even know if the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. We just assume that because Andromeda, which is the nearest galaxy to us, is a spiral galaxy. So we just assume Milky Way is that way. But nobody's out there taking pictures of the Milky Way, okay? So um, let's say we are... Can I, can I ask, how do they generate those images that they show us of the Milky Way? Is that just actually a picture of Andromeda? or They're, they're all artist conceptions, <laughs> or they are pictures of another galaxy that spiral that they can see through the Hubble telescope or any telescope, basically. So... Um, at any rate, let's just say that Milky Way is a spiral galaxy and that we are on one of its arms. OK, so what's going to happen is um, you stick stick a pencil, draw a picture of the galaxy, stick a pencil in where you think the Earth is and rotate the paper. That's how it's going to work. OK, and yeah. And it's going to go around once every 24 hours or 23 hours, 56 minutes. So that's that's how you take care of that. So no fuss, no muss on that issue at all. On the um, on the sun, because you since you mentioned it, Christian, the sun is actually the center, the geometric center of the universe. 
and everything basically is aligned with the sun. Okay, so that's an interesting little twist in geocentrism because the very reason that the earth doesn't move is because it's not the geometric center. It's what, what physics calls the center of mass or center of gravity. And those don't move. Okay. You could have anything rotating around the center of mass and that center of mass by definition doesn't move. Okay. Cause there's no inertia making it move. So you have two, two uh, things that you have the sun as the geometric center and you have the earth as the gravity center and they work in tandem. Okay. And that's called the ecliptic. The earth is on the sun's ecliptic. And if I could get into some, you know, complicated physics here, I could tell you how, what it means when, when I say that the sun and the earth work together. Yeah, and we, we would get into the cosmic microwave yeah, radiation yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But I, I will mention that I did see the principle a few months ago, so I'm generally aware of some of the physics behind it. But again, okay. physics, I remember what caused me to shift from being a science focused person to a humanities focused person was taking AP physics. So, okay, good for you. <laughs> all right, now let me deal with some of these other things here. Um, um about Bellarmine, for example, he was basing his argument on mostly what the tradition had told us about this issue, what the fathers have told us, what the philosophers told us, and philosophers in that day were scientists, what um, the medievals had said. And by the way, the Catechism of the um, Council of Trent says four times that it that it uh, approves of geocentrism, okay? So um, he, he had that in his arsenal. So that was his basic argument against Galileo, that, look, if you're going to go against 1,600 years of tradition, you better have something in your pocket that you can whip out and say, here's why, okay? Isn't it obvious? And so Ga that was Ga Bell Bellarmine's next attack, was that whatever Galileo had in his pocket it was bogus. And even today, we know it's bogus, like the tides causing, you know, the earth rotating, all that kind of malarkey. So, um, you know, Bellarmine was wise enough to say this guy has no proof for his science. So that's the science end that Bellarmine un uh, was dealing with. But Bellarmine didn't really know the science any better than anybody else did, because science basically was in its infancy at that time. OK. Galileo had all these theories, and Tycho Brahe had his theories, and and blah, 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 but they were all theories. Nobody really knew, because nobody was doing classical physics like Newton did when Newton came along about 100 years later, not about 75 years later, and were the first one in history to give us equations in physics, you know, F equals M-A or F equals GMM over R squared for the gravitational force and all kinds. He was the first one. So that's when physics was really born. And everybody thought that, wow, uh, Newton's using these major equations and he can show you by math that it all works out. Um, there's a big story about Newton, okay, that I, you know, I, I'm going to tell you eventually, but that's where the world was at that time. Nobody knew, knew much in Galileo's day. So Bellarmine and Galileo could spar back and forth, but Bellarmine's going to win the argument because he's got tradition on his side, and he's not going to go against tradition. Even when he said, well, if they can prove their theory, then you know, we'll just go reinterpret Scripture. But that was after they had convicted Galileo. And we know Bellarmine's not going to convict anybody of formal heresy unless he really is sure that it's never going to change. Because if he's wrong, he could put the church in a quagmire that it's never going to get out of. Here, your highest official says, you know, well, if we could be wrong, we're going to reinterpret Scripture. Well, then we got to reinterpret Scripture about everything. So did Bellarmine really mean that he was going to give in? No. He was resolute that he was right because he had tradition on his side and he was a faithful man of God. That new tradition was guided by the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit wasn't going to take a vacation dealing with the Galileo issue. He was going to be right there with the church. 
Okay. So that's why he was so good. And he already proved himself with the Protestant Reformation. This guy was top notch. You couldn't put, get anything past Bellarmine. Um, and then dealing with the science of the fathers, they, they were in a much more primitive state than, than even Bellarmine was. I mean, what little science they had, they used, but we would not really call that, uh, you know, basic classical science that we use today. Okay. They weren't using equations. They were just guessing what was occurring out there. You know, like Ptolemy guessed and Aristotle guessed about how the universe was composed. I mean, they believed that crystalline spheres were housing the planets, and that's how they rolled around the sun, which is, you know, from our point of view, it's ridiculous. It just doesn't happen. But that was their concept. And so they dealt with these concepts. But they tried to be as faithful to Scripture whenever they proposed a scientific explanation to what they saw what was going on out there. You see, so they never divorced science from scripture. They always tried to meld the two, which is very good, actually. So just a few thoughts. Okay, so um, the immediate thought that comes into my mind, and I think Gideon was also thinking the same thing, um, because I think we've talked about this before and you've mentioned it. So when it comes to the magisterium, so are we in a similar situation as when we think of uh, theistic evolution or young earth creationism, where it's, it's not, it's not something which is, uh, which has been included in more solemn definitions, but it is something that has been mentioned uh, in, in a, in a lower level of the magisterium, because it seems at least from what I've heard, and I haven't done as exhaustive a study it, that the current magisterium is very much against uh, the interpretation that you're putting forward. The current magisterium, yeah, they're against everything, you know, that that because they constantly listen to mainstream science. That's all they listen to. Mm -hmm. So obviously, obviously, these guys are without the needed information to make a, an intelligent decision. They've already decided whose side they're on, and the the Pontifical Academy of Science, for example, has a hundred members, and they won't let one creationist in to be a member, and that's been true for decades. OK, so we know where the Vatican's coming from on this issue mm -hmm. because of who they listen to. Um, so is that the only area of the magistrate we wanted to cover? Or did you want to cover the uh, one with dealing with Galileo also? And what um, I, I would I would love to hear about um, the magisterial because the magisterial weight doesn't always include doesn't only include our current magisterium, but magisterium yeah. in the past. So what weight does the magisterial documents from the uh, 16th century have on this? I also wanted to ask on that while you're going on that I've heard that in the 1800s, there was like some magisterium reversing the Galileo decisions. I don't know almost anything about it. So if you could maybe let, go into that as well. You, let me tell you, because this will knock your socks off okay um in um lawrence gonzaga is calling me for some reason i don't know why um i'm tempted to answer the phone because he always has something important but i'm gonna let it go <laughs> anyway okay so we're talking about 1820 right around there okay so a a guy named canon satelli was a canon for the Catholic Church, writes a book, and he's saying that that heliocentrism is a fact. Okay, now that's gone beyond what the church had allowed. The church said, okay, you can consider it a hypothesis, but not a fact. Okay, you can you can use if it's a hypothesis, you can use it whenever you want to use it, but don't tell everybody it's a fact. So this guy comes along and says it's a fact. And he wants to get his book, an imprimatur. So at that time, the man in charge of imprimaturs, which is the, um, he is the um, head of the apostolic palace. And he is the one that can give the authority to give an imprimatur. And his name is Father Filippo Anfasi. And he says, no way, Jose, because... Two centuries ago, our popes, cardinals, sat down, figured this thing out, and said, it's a formal heresy, okay? And they convicted Galileo. He, he, he was very knowledgeable about what happened. So, Canon Satelli didn't like that answer, so he went to the commissary of the index, 
who his name was Maurizio Olivieri, and complained that he couldn't get his book published because Infasi was stopping him. And you got to understand, by this time, 1800s, the French, the English, the Germans in Europe, they were just pounding the church to stop this geocentric nonsense and get with the world and become heliocentrists. And it never stopped. So Canisatelli had the world on his side by this point because everybody considered Newton a household name. And Newton two centuries earlier had proved that the earth moved, okay? So that's the pressure that was going on. And Olivieri was a very astute cardinal, sharp as attack. And he and Aunt Fossey went back and forth arguing about this. Aunt Fossey would not budge an inch because he was going to stay with tradition. And Maurizio Olivieri was a liberal. Okay. And he eventually, he couldn't get anywhere with Aunt Fossey, So he went to uh, Pius VII. Now, Pius VII was a very weak pope. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of him, but he's frail in all the pictures that we have of him, all the paintings. And this guy went through hell with Napoleon. Um, Napoleon stormed the Vatican in 1809, took Pius VII out of the Vatican, and stuck him in Florence for five years in incarceration. Okay. You don't hear about that too much, but that's what happened. So this guy was treated like a criminal, Pius VII. And eventually, at 1814, Napoleon let him out, put him back in the Vatican. But Pius VII was a changed man. He wasn't healthy to begin with. Now he was psychologically demented. And so he's trying to run the Vatican. And Maurizio Olivieri comes to him and says, we got a problem. In Fossi's stopping this book from being, um, you know, to get an imprimatur, what can we do about it? Pius, you know, you didn't know, you know, well, what's, what else do you have? And so Maurizio Olivieri made up a big lie to convince Pius VII to get this imprimatur to Canon Zatelli. This is what he said. He said, well, look, yeah, we have the things back in the 1600s, you know, where the church dealt with this issue. But they weren't really dealing with the issue of whether the earth moves or not. What they were dealing with was they were saying that the only reason that Galileo was condemned by the church was because he didn't have elliptical orbits of the planets like Kepler did, which was a flat out lie. Because the church of 1600, 1616, 1633 never even discussed elliptical orbits, much less use that to convict Galileo, okay? So this guy was a big liar. And then he said, and the other issue was that if the earth moved, everybody was afraid that the, that the air would be sucked away from the earth and we wouldn't be able to breathe. Then that's why the church wanted to keep the earth still, because they didn't want to scare everybody. So these were two bold, bold-faced lies that Oliveri told Pius VII. And Pius VII didn't have any recourse. And this is why. Because when Napoleon came in 1809, he took all the Galileo records away from the Vatican, every single one of them, 7,000 documents, and put them in a, in a library in Paris. Okay? So even if the Pope wanted to check up on Olivieri's story, he had no recourse because there weren't any records. Okay? So this was the perfect storm. The perfect storm because... Pius VII eventually gave in. All right, give him the imprimatur. And then everybody says, oh, the Vatican gave in. They gave an imprimatur to Canon Satelli for his book on heliocentrism. And, and then Olivieri tried to get, um, they, they figured that things were moving in their direction. So Olivieri tried to get um, Galileo and Copernicus taken off the index of forbidden books at the same time, right after they gave the imprimatur to Canon Satelli. And the, the council came together and said, no, we're not going to do that. Okay. We're, we'll give you this much and that's, and no more. Now it's interesting that Olivieri's cohort during this time was Cardinal Caffalari. Cardinal Caffalari eventually became Gregory the 16th in, in uh, 1831. 
And you know what Cardinal Kyle Ferlari, who is now uh, Gregor the Sixteenth, did three years later? He took Galileo and Copernicus off the index without saying one word to ex of explanation. Just took it off. Now, either he did it or some of his cohorts underneath of him did it, but it got taken off. And right after that, there was an avalanche in the scientific world. And the word got out that the Vatican finally gave in because they took Galileo off the index. And then you get this avalanche of, you know, the, Vel the Velhausen theory about how to interpret the Old Testament. You get Darwin and his buddies coming along and preaching evolution. You get all kinds of stuff because the door was now open, you see. But it was all based on the lie that Olivieri told the Pius VII. So we have some major malfeasance going on at the Vatican. And that's why the door is open as it is today. So there was a there was a knowledge among the uh, um, among the cardinals and, and popes of the church before this affair that this wasn't something that was just some low level uh, magisterial teaching that they could just throw off that it was um, a solemn teaching of the church, correct? Um, well, by by eighteen hundreds that was starting to wane, and you, but you have good guys like Father Anfossi who stuck to his guns and said, no, this is tradition. You can't change this just because somebody comes along and says heliocentrism is a fact. And, and Olivieri knew that. Mm -hmm. He knew that it wasn't going to fly. So he had to make up these lies in order to get it to fly. And it worked. Okay. So we're going to, unless you had any thoughts, Gideon. I don't think I ha I'm trying to think if I have anything I will say what seems to me to be the best scriptural argument for geocentrism is just looking at the cosmology of the universe and especially the Old Testament as it lays out that it seems that you sort of have a three layer universe where you have the heavens, then you have the earth, and then you have the waters under the earth. And this was then taken up even in... Um, quite a bit of scholastic thought. I know, in, for example, in the Summa, St. Thomas argues that in the age to come, hell will actually be in the center of the earth. Um, and it does seem to be that if this is the spot which is furthest away from where God is, this is in the center of the universe, because it seems to be that the planets in the eyes of scripture are somehow an ontologically different spot than the earth. And it seems to me that cosmology is important to how scripture, how scripture sees the world. Yeah. Christian, do you want to say anything or want me to comment on that? Oh, you can comment on that. I was just going to okay. get into uh, questions that we have in the chat, but if you have anything to say, then I can hang out as long as you guys want. Yeah. Um, by the way, how long did you want to go on this? Uh, uh, we can, we can go as long as, as you guys have time. I have, right. I've work at 10 o'clock because okay. I'm a night shift I, I'm, worker. I'm free all night. So I, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just got off work right before this. So, <laughs> okay. So we're all free. Um, <laughs> Um, the fathers in the medievals did struggle with what to do with the water. Okay. Um, even Chrysostom believed that the earth was in the water somehow. And um, so that got up, but no other fathers were went in that direction. Um, so you do have a little problem with the water, but most of them understood, especially Augustine, who basically led the field on this, that when the, when the scripture of Genesis one says that there's waters above the firmament, that means there's waters above the edge of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. There's, as we see in Revelation, right? There's that crystal sea at the very edge of the universe, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could apply that. Um, but, and he said, look, we don't, and I, I quote this all the time from Augustine because it's just so good. He says, look, we don't know what the form of the water is at the edge of the universe. For mm -hmm. all we know, it's probably ice because ice freezes below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. At least the fathers knew that, that the ice came at a certain temperature. Okay. Um, they didn't maybe know exactly what temperature it was on the Fahrenheit or Kelvin scale or whatever, but they knew that that happened. And I, and, and um, well, as Gustin said, it's probably ice and Hildegard, St. Hildegard, who was a genius in her day said basically the same thing mm -hmm. that it was ice up there. So, 
Um, that's what they did with the water that originally surrounded the earth on the first day. The firmament pushed most of the water out and it became ice at the rim of the universe. So that, that, oh, interesting. that satisfied that, everybody. Yeah, that, that confirms what's a little bit of what I've read on this from a scriptural perspective. Um, just because I'm very interested in symbolism in the Old Testament. And so yeah, I wanted to also ask someone on this point if... Um, no, I think I totally forgot my, oh yeah. Um, if you think that this is as important of an issue as the young earth issue, because it seems to me that the young earth issue is very, very important because it's asking, do we believe the narrative taught to us by scripture versus it seems to me more that this has less of an effect than basically, that, for example, the young earth, right? This We're asking the question of, and especially a young humanity, we're asking the question, is the story taught to us by scripture, the real history of humanity? We're asking about our history. This seems a little bit more abstract. I don't know. Do you think it's as important? Well, it's like saying, you know, what's more important, the, uh, the steering wheel of a car or the tires? You know, they're both important if you're going to get something. Okay, yeah. Okay. So I, I, don't, I don't tend to rate them in that way. Fair enough. Yeah. I just know this, that I don't think Darwin – Darwin would have had such a platform if the earth or if the church had not already given in by taking Galileo and Copernicus mm -hmm. off the index. Yeah. Do you think see. that some of the fear within the church of the church never put Darwin on the index, unfortunately? Do you think that's partly because there was already a fear because of the bad press the church had gotten because of Galileo? Well, by that time, it was very hard. The, uh, by 1859, it was it was the, the the mood in the world was the church is changing, and we're not going to let her go back even one step to where she was before. Now there was a valiant effort put up by the church from 1860 through the latter end of the 1800s. First by the Council of Cologne on creation, where it said. Adam and Eve were, were made ex nihilo by God. There is no evolution, blah, 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 blah. And, and that was approved by Pius the Ninth. Oh, that Pius the Ninth. That's quite recent. Yeah. Yeah. So so the Council of Cologne started the churches, and that was one year after after Darwin published his Origin of Species. Okay. So the church came right in, did their duty through a local council approved by the Pope. And then we had the major Catholic scientists censored by the Pope. Zom was one of them. Who um, Headley was another. Um, I forget the other guy's name. But we had three major Catholic scientists all pushing for evolution, and they were censored. Okay. So we were pretty strong in the latter part of the 1800s. And then La Savilita Catolica, which was a Jesuit journal, um, and had to be approved by the Vatican Secretary of State before anything was published, also came down on evolution. Okay, so we were pretty strong. The Catholics were holding on, even though they really had no science in that day to go against what Darwin was saying. There wasn't creation science, basically, until Whitcomb and Morris wrote the Genesis Flood in the 1960s. You know, that's when it started. Mm -hmm. So... We can understand why Pius XII or uh, any other pope had a hard time with evolution because there was no science that was bringing it down. All the science that the pope was hearing from his advisors was supporting evolution. So yeah. we were in a quandary then. Yeah. yeah, and it's so unfortunate that there seems to be this divide between um... – the Protestant creation scientists on one hand and the Catholic theologians on the other, because it seems that there's almost no Catholics around in these creationist scientist circles, or when there are some Catholic creationist scientists, they're not really on good terms with the Protestant ones. I know there was a divide in the Protestant community for a while between the more sort of evangelical Protestants and the Seventh-day Adventists, and that seems to have been healed a little bit. And I'm really praying and hoping that there could be perhaps some healing between the Catholics and the Protestants here, because even if we're not going to agree on doctrine entirely, it would be good if we can at least work together to push forward creation science.
Yeah, well, you know, it's surprising with Catholic Answers where Jimmy Aiken works that, you know, they're pushing the modern church. And if the modern, if the modern church is pushed, well, the modern church is pushing ecumenism and dialogue with our opponents. Yes. But when it comes to science, creation yes. science, all, all, all of a sudden the ecumenism stops. Yeah, all of a sudden they're talk. horrible Protestants. Yeah. Now, I, I, I had this a little bit because I am a convert. I don't know if you, how much you know about my history, but I used to be Eastern Orthodox for a few years. And that's where I was convinced of creationism because one of the arguments the Eastern Orthodox apologists pull out is they have quite a number of recent saints who all condemned evolution as a heresy. And they can they will really emphasize, I mean, they don't really have a magisterium. They just have the consensus of the fathers. So they showed me scripture can only teach a young earth. They showed me that all the fathers teach a young earth. And they showed me all the recent saints taught a young earth. And that really convinced me, you know, I was like, well, I don't really have anyone, a single person I can appeal to besides some random modern bishops when I was Eastern Orthodox. And if the Catholic Church had ruled out young earth creationism as not acceptable, I think I would have had a really, really difficult time going from being Eastern Orthodox to being Catholic. Um, and I knew the question was open. I knew, unfortunately, that I was giving up my best <laughs> argument, which is that the recent Orthodox saints spoke on the matter. I have since discovered many recent Catholic saints have spoken out against evolution, such as St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, but it did seem that, um, yeah, I think that would have been a big stumbling block to me if I had to give up young earth creationism to become a Catholic. And I don't think that... One of the arguments Catholic Answers makes is we don't want this to be a stumbling block to an atheist becoming Catholic. And I fully agree. If this is a stumbling block to an atheist, don't discuss creationism with them. You know, if that's going to be their stumbling block, just let them know the church can, let's, keeps their view once they're Catholic. Try and work on them a little bit. Um, but if they're a Protestant or Eastern Orthodox, why aren't we saying, hey, you're young earth creationism. You don't have to give that up at all to become Catholic. You can come in with those views all the same because the church, the magisterium says you can hold either perspective. Why are we telling the fundamentalist Protestants that when they're going to become Catholic, we act like they're going to have to give up their young earth creationism? Well, you know, it all goes back to Galileo. Hate to say it, but the church does not want to go through another Galileo experience. You mm -hmm. see, where they condemn the man, and then it's later found out, mm -hmm. so-called in science, that they were wrong. Yeah. They it's want to avoid that at all costs. See, the mm -hmm. Protestants didn't go through that. The Catholics did. So that's the fear. That earlier class I mentioned I had taken on um, Bellarmine and Galileo was really just on the Renaissance as a whole. And it was interesting that I was had one other Eastern Orthodox friend in that class. I was still Eastern Orthodox at the time. And the rest of the class was Catholics. And the only people in the class who were willing to stand up and defend Bellarmine, their whole discussion-based class, was me and the other Eastern Orthodox guy. <laughs> and that was because I had been so used to defending young earth creationism on the campus to fellow Catholics. Um, I knew when Bellarmine said, hey, if we give up... Um, Ge geocentrism what's next what are we going to give up next i'm saying hey i've been making the same arguments all along here about young earth creationism maybe he's correct that we need to go one step further back to geocentrism yeah that, um, i convinced a lot of people that that's the depth they have to go to yeah and it does seem interesting that I mean, if you look at the traditional lists of the quadrivium, the only like modern science we would consider on there is astronomy. That was the one all the ancients studied really strongly and considered really important. And so perhaps if we change the change in astronomy is what caused the question about the whole of the classical education system. So I work within classical education and it's interesting that we discuss the trivium a lot. But we don't discuss the quadrivium all that much because when we get to the uh, music part, we're going to have to discuss ancient music theory. And then when we get to the astronomy part, we're going to have to discuss Ptolemy. And, that, and now we're off in crazy land and that's not acceptable anymore. <laughs> yeah. One thing that's different between the creation uh, debate and the geocentric debate is the creation evolution debate can live with opponents on either side and not really, at least directly, deny the existence of God. 
because even the theistic evolutionists believe that, you know, God plays a part in evolution or the progressive creationists believe that God intermittently makes evolution work, you see. So it's not a matter of getting God out of the way, although you and I know that that's what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. But on the geocentric thing, it's a little it's a little bit more cut and dry, a little bit more black and white. Because if a scientist has to admit that the Earth is in the center of the universe, what does that imply? It, well, he knows it can't happen by chance, you see. He knows that instinctively. And I've read that in their books. So he knows instinctively that if he admits the Earth is in the center, that means God exists. And I do if God exists, that then he's responsible to God. Mm -hmm. That's what they don't want. That's what they've been trying to get away from with the Big Bang, the multiverse, this, that, and the other thing to patch up the Big Bang because it's not working. But that's what their motivation is. Oh, but don't you know the Big Bang was invented by a Catholic priest? And that's basically dogma that if a Catholic priest said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? They say that about Lemaitre, but it's it's not really true. This is what he This is what he did. The, the guy who started the ball rolling was Edwin Hubble because he's the guy that looked out in the telescope that he used at Mount Wilson in California, and he saw galaxies for the first time in history. We had notions of galaxies, but he saw them. And then he studied them, and he, and he saw that all these galaxies had a redshift. That means the, the light from the galaxies is leaning toward the red end of the spectrum. And he saw that everywhere he looked, north, south, east, west, you know, everywhere he looked, he saw the galaxies had a redshift. And he knew instinctively that if he saw redshift everywhere, that put the Earth in the center of the universe. Why? Because if it wasn't in the center, then we would see some blue shifts out there. Yeah. But we don't. All we see is red. So he knew that was the case. So... He writes in his book, 1937 book, this is horrible. This is this is a disaster. You know, we got to get out of this Earth-centered universe that I'm seeing in my telescope. Okay? So he's scratching his head trying to figure out, well, how do we get out of there? Well, here's how you do it. He figured it out. He says, you get rid of the Euclidean geometry, which gets rid of the center, and you make a Riemannian hyperspace, and we'll just call it a balloon with a surface. And it has a balloon has no center. It just has a surface. And we'll put all the galaxies on the surface of that balloon. And then we'll blow it up and expand it. And what's going to happen when you do that? Well, as those galaxies expand away from each other on the surface of that balloon, they're all going to see a redshift from one another because the light, the light is being stretched and it's going to go to the red end of the spectrum. Okay. So that's how we get out of having the earth in the center. So he's the one that invented the Big Bang. It wasn't until Fred Hoyle came along about eh, 15 years later and dubbed it the Big Bang. But Father Lemaitre, in about 1936 or so, he said, all right, so if the, if the universe is expanding on this balloon, what happens if we make it go backwards? See, Hubble hadn't thought of that yet. What happens if we make it go backwards and to the point of where it started okay and he says well we do that and that means you're left with a little seed and they didn't know what to call that little seed mm -hmm. later they called it they called it a singularity whatever that means it just means a single point but he said we have a little seed and so the, the whole thing about the cosmic egg started with lametri and then he said then it exploded okay so that's what he did he didn't invent the big bang that was somebody before him but, you know, since he's a Catholic priest, you know, they, they try to attribute it to him. Yeah. I do have to think there is something providential to that, though, that even when they try and come up with a theory to disprove the traditional Christian view, they end up at least refuting an eternal universe in the process. And so perhaps <laughs> that is still God working there and saying, OK, if you're going to deny me in this way, I'm still going to make you think the universe began and I'm going to leave you to try and figure out how it began then. <laughs> okay. My, yeah. my just, my just stupid or how, how does the blowing a balloon thing work? Because 
to yeah, well, what's in the middle of the balloon? It, it, may, maybe to explain it from my, I can try and explain it from a non-scientist that I understand it. From what I understand, <laughs> this is a four-dimensional balloon and it's a three-dimensional surface to the balloon then? No, it's a two-dimensional surface because it has... Oh, okay. Surface. Yeah. Interesting. You're, okay. not using, thought... you're not using Euclidean geometry. You're using Riemannian geometry. Oh, okay. So I was I was misunderstanding you then. Okay. Yeah. So it blows. Uh, that's another question. They they didn't answer then, and they can't answer now because they have the problem with their accelerated universe expanding, and they have no energy to make it expand. That's why they talk about dark energy and dark matter and all this stuff because yeah. they need ninety six percent of the energy of the universe to make this thing expand the way they think it's expanding yeah. and they that, don't. That's something I brought up in my debate with Jimmy Aiken is I said at one point, he said at one point, Oh, in order to explain how all the oceans don't vaporize with um, radioactive decay during the flood, you would need some unknown cooling mechanism. First of all, I don't even buy that part, but I didn't want to debate that with him in the debate. But the other problem I pointed out is, yeah, in the secular scientists, they have to make up what, like 75% of the matter and like 96% of the energy in the universe is undetectable because otherwise their formulas don't work. And now I don't think they're being stupid when they do that. I think they're thinking they have good reason to do it. But the good reason is this: if this doesn't exist, our formulas, which we think are true, don't work. So it must exist. Well, in the same way, we as creationists could, at least in theory, say, and I don't even buy that we have to do this, but we could in theory say that during the flood, there was some unknown cooling mechanism because otherwise our equations don't work out. Well, there's a lot of water. That's pretty good cooling, isn't it? Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I just think the real problem here is, and this would be a whole separate thing, but the meta I don't think we have yet fully understood the metaphysics of radiometric decay because now we're looking at something below the level of substantial form well according to the scholastics that doesn't actually exist it only virtually exists and now we're discussing things that only virtually exist and this is the big problem i have with some of the creation scientists is they don't have the metaphysics they might be really good on their science but they're accepting fundamentally modern pre presuppositions about how we do science yeah i understand that um I, I have to be honest with you, though, mm -hmm. okay? I'm not as enamored with the accident-substance paradigm as a lot of other Catholics are, okay? So yeah. I don't use that as a a, a, a buffer, I mean, or as a um, buttress to the geocentric argument because, yeah. first of all, it goes way beyond their heads, okay? Mm -hmm. And you, you got to get them back down to earth and talk about things that they can feel and touch and smell and see. So um, that's why I don't go in that direction, okay? But um, what I would say, though, is um, the, the, the geocentric universe is such a stable universe, okay? Think about this. The Earth in the heliocentric system turns on its axis and spins once a day, okay? Evolutionists admit that if the Earth is what 4.5 billion years old that at some point you know maybe and 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 um, what's his name said this i forget his name i'll get it in a second he said a billion years ago the earth was traveling uh was uh, rotating uh, in about 10 hours for the day okay and ever since then it's slowed down all right well that just begs the question the earth has been according to them rotating for thousands and thousands of years and we have this same rate of rotation, how is that possible? Considering all the internal and external forces that are on the earth. Now think about this, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, these are all internal forces. Every one of them will slow down the rate of a earth that's rotating, okay? Because that's the laws of physics, F equals MA. So, and those are just the internal ones. Then you consider the external forces on a rotating Earth. Um, lunar gravity, solar gravity, planetary perturbations and their gravity, cosmic rays. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a list of about five other things. I can't remember them right now. But so you got all these forces on this Earth. And it still rotates 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds every single day. 
And they've only been able to detect maybe a micron of a second difference from over like 50 years. Okay. So this thing is stable. But how can that be explained by a rotating Earth? It can't. Because they even admit themselves that the Earth should slow down. And we've already seen Venus slow down. It's changed six minutes in the past 10 years. Saturn has slowed down in its rotation. Okay. But the Earth doesn't for some reason. Why is that? Well, the geocentrists have an answer. And that is because the Earth isn't rotating. It's fixed. And the universe itself is rotating around the Earth. And since the universe is so massive, it has great inertia. Inertia is the principle of a body to remain in motion unless stopped by a net external force. So once you start that universe rotating, it's going to keep on going ad infinitum at the same rate because it's so massive. And that's what makes our universe stable, you see. God knew what he was doing when he put it together. And plus, there's no friction outside the universe to stop it. So we're going to have that continual daily rate. And if if that rate had slowed down even a fraction, that means the sun that's going across the sky would stay in the sky too long. And the heat from the sun would start to burn up things and start to make the water boil and the plants curl up and the trees die and everything else. So that sun... God has calculated, has to go across the earth in a certain amount of time, so a certain amount of heat is distributed to the earth, so it won't burn up. And then, of course, it can't go too fast, because then the earth will be too cool, okay? So, everything's perfectly designed. Yeah. One last mm -hmm. question I have on the science of the earth's rotation is if the whole universe is rotating around the earth, how does that work at like the, if you're standing at the edge of the universe, would you object to the current um, le popularly accepted views of the speed of light? Or would you say that there's time dilation out there? What, what, what do you say for that? All right. So what people don't know is this. When Einstein said that the light speed was limited, that was for special relativity that he invented in 1905. Okay. 10 years later, he invented general relativity in 1915. In general relativity, light can go any speed, okay? And material objects can go any speed. What it, and, and so what's the difference? Well, in special relativity only deals with inertial frames. That is, frames that are fixed or going the same speed. General relativity deals with accelerated frames. And what's the universe if it's rotating? It's an accelerated frame in physics. So if it's an accelerated frame, Einstein's own general relativity says that light can go any speed. As a matter of fact, Einstein says, the farther away you are in an Einsteinian geocentric universe from the Earth, the faster light and material objects can go. Okay, so that takes care of the starlight problem because it's not limited to 186,000 miles per second. So now, that, and let me just say one more yeah. thing. The heliocentrists and the big bangers use the same formulas, okay? Because they say that the universe is expanding past the speed of light at the edge of the universe. Well, how can they say that? Well, because they use general relativity, okay? The, the, according to them, the universe is expanding four times the speed of light. You can only do that in general relativity. They do the same thing for the Big Bang, because if you, the Big Bang could only explode at 186,000 miles a second, the universe would be too small for anything to happen, much less biological evolution, you know, 8 billion years later. So what they have to do is they have to use general relativity to explode the Big Bang, and they can do that because it's a non-inertial accelerating frame. So they, we're, I'm just doing what they have already done with their system. Yeah. So that explosion that Jimmy Aiken brought up during the debate, the supernova that supposedly was seen 88 million years ago, yeah. when do you think that that went off? Um, when they saw it, probably less than 24 hours. Okay. Why? Okay, look. The only way that you can empirically measure the distance of the universe is by stellar parallax. But that can only go out to, from 300 to 600 light years. Okay. 
If something's 88 million light years away, there's no way stellar parallax is going to be able to measure that. So what else will they use? Well, guess what? They try to use redshift. And you, you know the dubious history of redshift already with Hubble, okay? And now they're going to put a speed and distance on it and say, well, the more the redshift is in the galaxy, the further it is away. And that means the further light has to travel to us at 186,000 miles per second. Uh, well, wait a minute. Didn't you tell me that the universe was expanding? Okay. So how can it expand at the edge and not expand on the inside? Okay. So if the universe is expanding on the inside, then it's not an inertial frame. And you can't tell me that light can only travel 186,000 miles per second in an inertial frame. Or I'm, I'm sorry, in a non-inertial frame. Okay. So th th there's contradictions all over the place. And if you use try to use redshift for measuring distance and speed, you're going to run into a lot of problems because there's about 50 other explanations for redshift in secular science. And one of the major contestants against using redshift was a secular scientist named Holt Narp. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. Holt Narp said, look, you can't use redshifts for measuring distance and, and speed because quasars are right next to the galaxies. And we can prove this by the fact that there's stellar filaments between the galaxy and the quasar. And the quasar has three times the redshift that a galaxy does. And yet they're in the same place. So how can redshift give us measure of time and distance? So in other words, they have no idea that this supernova is 88 million light years away. It's just a guess based on all the assumptions that they've made and all the assumptions can't be proven. Okay. So yeah, that's how we would answer that. Yeah. That was a really good point. There are some stuff, a uh, reframing of some things that I hadn't thought of until you just explained it that way, especially with the red shift. Um, I'm going to de definitely after this interview, I'm definitely going to have to go read a whole bunch more about this now. Cause now you think you've really piqued my interest that this is important for answering some of the old earth objections. I'd well, have a few, I have a few books for you that you can I can send you if you yeah. want. Yeah, that would be excellent. Yeah, the only book I had picked up is um, I have one book by um, Wolfgang Smith on some of these issues. Well, he'll never get into this stuff. Okay, but that would be good. It seemed he was getting into more of the metaphysics focus of it rather yeah, that, than that, this. That's where his baby is right there. Yeah, and, and that would be great. Thank you. By, by the way, he's a Platonist. Yeah, um, I, know, I know he has some metaphysical issues that. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to get into the chat. There looks like there's quite a few questions. So uh, if you have any questions, make sure you uh, throw them in the chat, everybody. And there was a question up here, but it looks like it disappeared. Somebody said that they had heard you say that, um, Dr. Sinjanis, they heard you say that if uh, geocentrism was, was proved to be incorrect, then Christianity would be proved to be incorrect or something to that effect. I never is said is that. you never said that? Okay. No. Okay. So they want me to say, say that, but I never said it. That that question has been asked probably, I don't know, 50 times since I've started this track. Oh, uh, so some somebody uh putting out rumors. Okay. You get all kinds of things when you're a geocentrist. <laughs> there you go. So we kind of went over this. Uh, what does uh, Mr. Sengenis make of current Roman Catholic magisterium allowing for heliocentrism? Um, well, the earth, uh, the, the church is only as good as the people that are in it. Okay. Um, so if these people are influenced by modern science, and we can say that started with Tilliard de Chardin. Okay. Here where you have a major evolutionist paleontologist from the late 1800s forcing his way into the church basically trying to upset all our doc traditional doctrines with his science and evolution you know the omega point and all that stuff that he talked about in the new sphere where we're getting all our knowledge from and it, it was crazy stuff okay but he started the bowl rolling there was another guy Ernest messenger in the late 1800s i mentioned zom i mentioned headley these guys were the liberals of their day Okay. Now remember, Pius the Ninth, he was a liberal before he got into the papacy, and then mm -hmm. he became a conservative after he was pope for a while. Okay. 
because he, he saw what the liberals were doing. They were basically ripping the Bible apart and reinventing Christianity from the bottom up, and he put a stop to it. Okay, and then Pius X after him did, and Leo the Thirteenth did. So the church was there to fight. Okay, but these guys, they're like rats, man. You you stop them one place and they go to another, and they continue mm -hmm. to exist just like rats do. And so we have a lot of rats in the church today. Okay, a lot of guys pushing for the, uh, let's say the Einsteinian, Hawking, Hubble universe. Because this is science, man. This is where the telescopes are and the microscopes are and, you know, all this, the oscilloscopes and, and, you know, the church doesn't have any of that stuff, you see. So how can they know anything? So we'll listen to these guys over here with all the scopes and they become convinced by them. Okay. And, and they think they're real scientists. Like Tillyard de Chardin thought he was a real paleontologist, but he's the very guy that tried to put a tooth and pilt down, man, to make it look like it was the missing link. And he got caught and exposed. Okay. But they do this all the time because they're scientists, you see. So that's what we're up against in the Catholic Church. We have a lot of people influenced by mainstream science and they won't listen to anything else and they won't give the popes anything else. That's what John Paul II said in 1996. Evolution is more than a theory. Why did he say that? Because all the information he's getting from his liberal advisors is all on the side of evolution. That's why. Yeah. He's not getting any creation science. You see? So that's where we are today, and hopefully it's going to change. And guys like Gideon, we need guys like that. Okay? And I hope we have a whole new crop of guys coming along just like you, because that's what we need to turn it around. I think there are a lot more young people moving my direction. I think this is where someone like Jimmy Aiken is concerned. You know, they spent this whole lot of time building up this generation to sort of conservative Catholics, but all the young people, they've either <coughs> left the church or they're becoming traditionalists. There's, I mean, I, when I entered my college, I went to uh, the Catholic University of America. I was one of the few traditionalists around. I had a large group of friends who were very conservative, but not traditionalists. They all just recently gathered to watch my debate. Most of them were telling me they agree with me or they're very sympathetic to my position. Um, I remember even just by the time I was leaving, the new incoming freshmen, many of them were traditionalists. I think mm -hmm. there's a large shift going on among the young people in the church. A lot of them on, I think it started with what mass they're going to, but I think it will continue even all the way to things like um, evolution and things like that. Yeah, I guarantee, I guarantee at least probably more than 95% of the people watching right now are uh, are under the age of 25. Yeah. And, and like you look at my demographics for people that watch when it comes to things like this that I that I cover, like very traditionalist sort of uh, sort of things, it's 95 97 percent below the age of 30. it's uh, i just guys, had guys from catholic university used to come to me and say you know we heard the catholic theology down there and they basically don't believe in it's catholicism it's, anymore it, would, it you, would on, you teach us would you teach us scripture and i said yeah. sure you know it depends on the professor because they have everywhere from like i had dr chad pecknold who's an absolutely excellent professor very traditional all the way to, I had one professor um, telling me about how the perpetual virginity is a third century belief. And when I showed her the perpetual virginity of Mary from scripture, she said, oh, that's just a later interpretation of it. St. Luke never would have understood it that way. Well, why, oh, is, yeah, she yeah. why is she teaching Mariology? Yeah. Well, you know what? We have guys uh, at, at, um, at Catholic University, Joseph Fitzmeyer was one of the mm -hmm. premier theologians at Catholic University. Catholic University is a liberal university. Well, let's, let's mm -hmm. admit that at the start here. It's not conservative anymore. You mm -hmm. get one or two or three. Yeah. But you're not, the major part of Catholic University is liberal. Fitzmeyer came from there and he worked with Father Raymond Brown. Father Raymond Brown was another liberal. Uh, he, he taught theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York the largest and most profound Protestant liberal seminary in the world. What's he doing at a Protestant seminary for Pete's sake? Yeah. Okay. So Brown and Fitzmaier wrote the new Jerome biblical commentary. 
in the 1960s and then had another edition in the 1970s. Okay. That is a piece of crap. I'm telling you, because it's all liberal. We don't believe the Bible's history anymore. We don't believe the Bible's theology anymore. Luke didn't know what he was talking about. Blah, 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 blah. And they rip our Catholicism apart. That's what we're dealing with today. The big problem also is you can't, as a Catholic, I feel like, enter a lot of academics and hold different views. So, um, for example, there was a number of people who commented on my debate with Jimmy Aiken saying, oh, you know, all the professional theologians, they all reject young earth creationism. They all believe in evolution. That's not true. I know plenty of theology professors who have told me personally that they are a young earth creationist. They can't well, here, speak here's public. what happens on they that. They can't speak publicly on it though, because if they did that, they would not be hired anymore. If they were well, public right. about their views, they'll talk to me about this on the phone. But they they will point me towards resources. They'll I, I talked with a while for a theology professor I'm friends with about my debate. We went over it together, and he fully agreed with all my points. But he could never talk about that publicly. Yeah, the, well, that's the same thing in secular um, uh, academia. The guys that are Feeding the world this big bang, no creator, multiverse, you know, everything and, and, and uh, evolution, all that. These are the big boys. These are the Lawrence Krauses and the Max Tegmarks. These are the guys you saw in my movie. George Ellis, the Einsteins, the Hawkings. These are the guys that reign. The other guys that teach high school or they teach college. They're a lot different than the upper echelon scientists. The upper echelon scientists are 95% atheist. That's according to Scientific American. The lower echelon guys are about 60% atheist. So you got a lot, you got 40% in there that want to believe in God, but they can't say anything or they're going to lose their job because yeah. these guys up here control it. You see? So that's what we're up against even in your circles. Yeah. And I'd love to, I I've really would love to study biblical studies. That's really my love is typology in the Old Testament. Um, that's what I'd love to go and get a graduate degree in, but I can't find like a single university where I could study it, scriptural studies from a traditional perspective. So I'm looking at going in and getting a degree in systematics because I think you can hold much that area, there seems to be a lot more traditional people in that area. Oh, yeah. Biblical studies is just but as yeah, liberal as it will be. I looked at doing, um, just taking a single class while I was at Catholic University on the Gospel of Matthew. And I Google the name and the professor who has it. And I come up with an article by him about how Matthew didn't write the Gospel of Matthew. Well, why am I taking a class on the Gospel of Matthew written by somebody who won't even believe, he doesn't even believe before we even get to the first line, the title. <laughs> Yeah. And that title is actually very important. Yeah. Uh, Kata uh, Mathon. Uh, yeah. Very, and um, I also, I looked into some more stuff with the biblical studies department at COA and I encountered an article by one of the professors there uh, reviewing some, it was a book review. So I couldn't look at the original book, but he was praising this book, arguing that Deuteronomy was written super late. And the argument that Deuteronomy was written super late is that the book of Proverbs, which is apparently agreed to be one of the earliest, doesn't reference Deuteronomy. So Prover Deuteronomy <laughs> must have been written after Proverbs. And then later, later in this exact same article, they argue that Deuteronomy alludes to Proverbs, and therefore Deuteronomy <laughs> must have been written after because it's drawing from Proverbs. And what, maybe the allusions just went the other direction. <laughs> yeah. These, th these, these, like biblical studies types like if you actually read what they're saying it's just stupid yeah. like there, there's and there's nothing there's nothing more about yeah. it you you had on um christian you had on the podcast a few days ago um matthew dr matthew levering who's a yes. great guy yes. um but he was defending some of this more higher critical stuff and he cited as one of the examples of good protestant biblical exegesis peter lightheart well, Peter Lightheart's uh -huh. a young earth creationist. Does Peter Lightheart not know um, genres of biblical texts? And that's why he's a young earth creationist? No, he's well respected as one of the best biblical scholars out there. It's just that he tends to be a little bit more quiet about his young earth creationist views. It's well, in all of his older stuff from the 90s, but very clearly there. The, here's the irony I see in that <laughs> whole picture is the Catholics had 
made a legacy for themselves by interpreting scripture literally. So mm -hmm. as, as I mentioned before, Matthew 26, 26, this is my body, take and eat. Interpret it literally, no questions asked. Yeah. We don't and care if we can't explain it, we're just gonna take it as it is. John 3, 5, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what's yeah. the water? Is it symbolic? No, it's literal, you have yeah. to have the water. And okay. this is so, something to let, let finish here in a yeah, Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Want. That won't be too much longer. Um, and 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 so on and so on. Everything in the Catholic Church was based on a literal interpretation of the Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Protestants come along and they don't want to do that. They want to look at Matthew 26, 26 and say, oh no, that's that's just symbolic. The word estin there, the, the Greek copulative, that's just symbolic. Okay. Because obviously a piece of bread can't become God. Who are you kidding? Okay. So they're basing it on their reason. Okay. They can't reason it out that that could be true. But the Catholic Church said, no, we don't care whether we can reason it out. We're just going to take it as it says. Okay. So they diverge. Protestants come along with John 3, 5. And, you know, unless you're born of water and the spirit, well, there's only a few denominations, the Episcopalians, Anglicans, and the Lutherans that look at that literally. All, all the rest of the thousands of denominations all look at that. Oh, that's just symbolic of, you know, the word of God or that you got cleansed of your sins or whatever. But it's not literal. Okay. So we see, isn't it amazing to watch the Protestants deny the literal interpretation of these most important passages because they all deal with salvation. And yet when they come to Genesis, we got to take that literally because that's God's word. OK, but the Catholics who have a legacy of taking the New Testament passages literally, when they get to Genesis, say, are you kidding? I can't interpret any of that literally. So it's just like two sides of the same coin. You yeah. see, it, it's amazing to watch, but that's the reality. Yes. Something that um, Dr. Levering, when he was on a few days ago on here, made a good point about is that. Um, St. Thomas says that whenever we're discussing doctrine, it has to be based on the literal sense. Yes. These other spiritual senses are good for edification, but doc be because those are a little less certain, we have to base our doctrine on the literal sense of scripture and look at yeah, that because, primarily. Because the, be careful the, with those words, though, because that's what Raymond Brown says. Yeah. The reason he says that is because he's trying to... the wrong to, meaning of literal, Yeah. He's, yeah, he's trying to distinguish between literal meaning and the literal sense. Why? Yeah. Because what he's going to say next is that the biblical writer can write fiction, and that's what he literally meant to write, mm -hmm. because they're going with the intent of the author. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll yes. have St. Thomas talk about uh, the improper and the proper literal sense. And with the improper literal sense, it's things that are idiomatic. Not something that's like, okay, let me write this whole story and just lie the entire yeah. time. And then, yeah. and then, okay, we have, we have our, we have our spiritual sense because it's a twofold sense. Therefore we can completely throw out the window. Yeah. That's not anything of what St. Thomas, St. Thomas meant when he talks about the literal sense in the, uh, in the introduction to his commentary on the sentences. And this is not what all the neo-scholastics meant. This is not what all the, uh, the broke Thomists, this is not what Banyas and Kajetan and, and, and all of these Thomists when they're some of the best biblical uh, interpreters in the history of the church drawing from the well of the fathers. Yeah. And this going, is, this is not what they Galileo, meant. Going back to Galileo, that's exactly what the church did in Galileo's day. That's what Bellarmine did. Cause that's what Thomas taught him. That's what uh, Bonaventure taught him. and St. Albert the great and everybody before him. This is the way you interpret scripture. You take it at mm -hmm. face value. Yeah. How hard can that be? You know, I would be interested to see if um, St. Albertus Magnus, uh, if, if he ever treated this question, because because he's he was known as being one of the best scientists of the of the medieval yeah, world. Yeah, he was very good. Yeah. 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 Okay, let me if you do that, let me know what he, what you find. Like, I will. Yeah. I will definitely look. OK, so yeah. we, we spent a long time on that question. So uh, okay. barely prodding asks just got in. So this might have been already asked if scripture, tradition and science all show geocentrism false. Will this show Romanism to be false? And by Romanism, he means uh, Catholicism. Well, I, mean, I think you already asked that. Um, oh, okay. I, I'm not going to answer any of those hypotheticals because they're going to take them and try to run with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. not something I want to do. Okay. So, AJ, you might have yeah. to help I, me with explaining I, what this question yeah. means. 
Yeah. Before you got into that question on the last question, I just wanted to add also that I feel like these hypotheticals are a bad argument. I mean, we could easily say, oh, if you were convinced that um, like Christ didn't rise from the dead, would you still be a Catholic? Well, no, at a certain point, I wouldn't. But I also believe that Christ did rise from the dead. So that's an absurd hypothetical. Yeah. We have to ask the question of whether these things are actually true or not, not just hypothetically. Right. Very good. Okay, so AJ, uh, my second question is about the experience says with uh, Foucault's pendulum and how accurate they seem to be. What's the explanation for the change if the earth is not moving? Oh, that's an easy one. Thank you for an easy one. Um, you see, there's this thing called relativity, rel relative motion. Okay. And what they discovered, especially with Einstein's theories, is that relative motion is not just a geometric phenomenon, it is a force phenomenon. In other words, the same forces that appear in a heliocentric universe, wherein you have the Earth rotating and the universe fixed, you're going to have with an Earth not rotating that is fixed and a universe rotating around it. You're going to get the same forces. Okay. And so what you see moving in the Earth rotating universe fixed frame that is the Foucault pendulum, the plane of the Foucault pendulum is going to turn around, at least at certain latitudes, you're going to see the same thing if a universe revolves around a fixed Earth. Why? Because a universe re re uh, ro rotating around a fixed Earth is, has angular momentum. Angular momentum is going to create a Coriolis force. And so the Coriolis force is going to turn the Foucault pendulum. But in, but in that frame, it's a real force, the Coriolis force. In the heliocentric frame, the Coriolis force is what they call a fictitious force. Why? Because they blame it on the different directions that the Earth and the um, universe are going. So it's more geometric. But in the geocentric frame, it's a real force, Coriolis force. As a matter of fact, in the geocentric frame, you have three forces that are created by the rotating universe. You have the centrifugal force, you have the Coriolis force, and you have the Euler force. All three of them work together to keep those celestial bodies where they are as the universe rotates, you see. So we have a scientific explanation why those stars don't go to the rim of the universe as soon as the, Earth, the universe rotates. Why? Well, because the Coriolis force is bringing them back in, because all those forces balance. And it is that same Coriolis force that turns the Foucault pendulum. So that's how we explain it. And this is all in my book. So it's, you know, it's, it's been there for the last 20 years. So you can get the book and find out for yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, so Elijah asks, this is another short one, I'm assuming. So is it true that Albert Einstein believed in geocentrism? Well, he didn't believe in geocentrism as his first go-to scientific theory, okay? But he found out that his general relativity theory forced him to accept geocentrism as a viable and logical model of the universe. He didn't know he was going to get there, but that's what he found when he got to the end of his theory, okay? So that's why we can use general relativity to support a geocentric universe because Uncle Albert already did it for us i'm just being the messenger boy okay and telling you how it works okay so do any of you think a flat earth is possible no i do i absolutely do not think it's no. possible uh, i will say it can be fun to play devil's advocate in defense of flat earth to make people realize that they don't know nearly as much about science as they think they do <laughs> and i think this That's is a good true, yeah I think this is a good thing. Most people say, oh, that's ridiculous. And if you start, if you just do some basic research on flat earth and find a few other arguments and start presenting them to people, you'll realize how quickly people who think geo or flat earthers are all dumb don't have a singular response to any of those arguments. <laughs> and it makes people realize, oh, wait, I am just believing the science I do because somebody told me it in public school like 20 years ago, and I somewhat remember it. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they actually sat down and studied why we understand the earth is round. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally on that. And um, I, I have a book I wrote on, on this called Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, 740 pages long. 
and I go into the Bible, the history, and the science of the flat earth issue. But I agree with Gideon. When I went to study it, I'm going, this is a little harder than I thought it was going to be. Okay. You have to know a lot of science. Let me just give you one example while we're on the question. Um, when you look across Lake Michigan from the uh, Michigan side, it's about what, 60 miles or so. Okay. Mm-hmm. And on the other side is Chicago, and you, you see the Chicago skyline, okay? Now, but, but if the earth is curved, you shouldn't be able to see that skyline at all because 60 miles of a curve of the earth is going to put those buildings at least 900 feet under the surface of the earth in your line of vision, and you won't be able to see them. But every April and May, you can see the Chicago skyline from the other side of Lake Michigan on the Michigan side. Okay. Why is that? Well, I had to go in and study why that was the case. And this was a real mind boggler. Okay. Because even the weatherman couldn't figure it out. But what, what happens is uh, the water starts to get warm around springtime, but not as warm as the air gets in the springtime. So there's like a 10 to 15 degree difference sometimes between the air temperature and the water temperature around April. And so what that does is the the difference in temperature refracts the light, curves the light. So you, that's why you can see the skyline in Chicago Mm -hmm. from Michigan because the light is bent, but you got to know science in order to get to that point refraction of light and temperature, humidity, all these things are involved. So it can be get quite cumbersome, but that's why it's not as easy as you might think so. I just think the, 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 the thing that made me so strongly reject flat earth is because there's usually the, um, the sort of story you'll get behind it about like, they're, they're not wanting you to there's this hidden knowledge where like you, you're okay you you know how you're an anti-darwinist well it's basically the same thing but with the earth and i'm like wait a second <laughs> you you th- this isn't just like a modern like 19th century innovation like they i've read people firsthand from the early medieval church who are rejecting flat earth this, this isn't this isn't something that was just made up in the last two or three centuries then your then your theory might have some merit to it yeah, yeah but this not- has always been the teaching I'm not convinced even the ancient Israelites believed the earth was flat because the passages that are always cited in scripture, they're always in the context of like poetry or something like that. And if you look in the context, it's clearly just trying to compare the earth to a temple or using base. I mean, we all believe the earth is round. We still use the words up and down constantly. We haven't all said that we're going to stop referring to up and down or even the heliocentrists. They still say, they still talk about the sun rising in the morning. This is all language we just commonly use that we shouldn't assume that because the Israelites use language like up and down that they believed the earth is flat. That's basically what it gets to versus and then they want to say, oh, because that now we can reject. They also believed in a young earth and we can reject that. Well, no, that's always in the context of historical annals that are clearly intended to be historical. And this is not the same thing. Yeah, you're right. It's easy to conflate a lot of things and confuse everybody. And that's what the game is. Yeah, so you can confuse people. And that's something if you notice in my Jimmy Aiken debate, Jimmy never explained how to actually exegete the passages of scripture I was citing. And that's what I kept trying to press him on. But yeah. he wouldn't give me an explanation of how can we actually exegete all the details in Genesis 11. He just sort of hand waved Genesis 11 isn't historical. And then I explained why it couldn't be. And he said he doesn't have enough time to address that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise known as a cop out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the other Paul, he asks, question for St. Janice, do you accept space exploration and astronomical, astronomical data on the orbit of the planets around the sun? How do you expect Earth from this, if so? How do I expect Earth from this? If... Except, except Earth from <laughs> this, not expectors. Uh, okay, so he means ACC. Okay, <laughs> except. Is that what he means? Except uh, I, uh, no, no, no. I think I like, think he means except... it doesn't apply to Earth. Oh, how yeah, do you yeah. exclude Earth from this? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't. We don't exclude it. Okay, so what? Here's here's what happens. Uh, remember that guy Newton? I told you this is probably a perfect time to talk about Newton. Um, uh, Newton said that the Earth goes around the Sun. Why? 
Well, because the Earth wants to go in a straight line. That's called inertia. The sun won't let it because the sun's gravity pulls the Earth in. So the result is that the Earth goes around in a curved line around the Earth. Okay? So that's the theory of how the, the universe or the solar system works, just if you have the solar system itself. And I would admit that if you just have a solar system and the sun, which is what, 95% of the mass in the solar system is the only star that you're worried about and you've got nine other planets, they all have to go around the sun. No questions asked. The question is, is the solar system the means by which we judge that motion? Okay, and Newton himself admitted, well, I can't say that. I'm assuming that the universe is stationary and absolute. And that's the way, and that's the only reason I can make my F equals MA equation. If I assume the universe isn't moving. But what if the universe was moving? Okay, and the earth was fixed. Well, Newton never answered that question. Okay. That didn't come along until 200 years later when Mach, Ernst Mach came along and said, hey, you know what? We don't have to have a fixed Earth. I mean, I'm sorry, rotating Earth in a fixed universe. We can have a rotating universe around a fixed Earth. And guess what? You're going to see the same things. Yeah. Nothing's going to change because it's all relative motion, you see. So that's how we would answer this question. It doesn't make any difference. You can put the Earth in the center, the sun in the center. And all the all the motions and distances are going to be exactly the same, you see. And that's what makes this a little hard because of the relative motion issue. So now you have to go into, well, what makes them move? And who has a better explanation for what makes them move? Well, I think the geocentric one does, as I told you about the universe with all its momentum going around and, and Earth. Um, that's why we can have the 23 hour day every day, you see, because everything's so uniform and stable did i answer that correctly did, did you think that's a, yes. a good answer yeah for you? Uh, i wanted to ask then is this do you think one of those things where if you do the first bit of science it seems like it's leading in one direction but actually if you take a step down you realize it's totally different just like it seems like Newtonian mechanics at first was moving away from an Aristotelian view and actually quantum physics has made us rethink that or how it seems like first digging up the fossils that seems to defend Darwin until you actually do some statistical analysis on them. I think Todd Wood has done an excellent job showing there's significant gaps between different groups of fossils showing that they actually are distinct created kinds no matter how many more fossils you dig up and throw into these models yeah, do you think it's something uh, like that that oh yeah 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 it's something like because even newton admitted that there they found a missing page from his principia a few years ago and i talked to the guy who found it and in that page that was missing newton says that a geocentric universe is possible if there was an additional force or forces outside the solar system to make it work, you see, so he knew intellectually that it was possible. He just didn't know where those forces could come from because his universe didn't move. But once you move the universe and allow it to rotate, it creates those forces, you see. So we're just following in Newton's past. But when everybody, you know, Kant said that Newton was the father of science and, Immanuel Kant was a very influential philosopher. So he had all of Europe following Newton because it looked like it really worked. Okay. And it did. It did work. <laughs> if you just confine it to the solar system, it worked. And it was much better than Galileo or Copernicus because all they did was geometry. They didn't do physics. Mm -hmm. So I could see why the world was convinced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, and um, so I want to ask on that, it also asks about space exploration. So do you oh. think that all the claims about space exploration are generally true, like we've been to the moon and so on? Well, I don't know about the moon issue, but I do mm -hmm. know that we can send satellites up very easily or space probes because they're unmanned. Okay, we don't have to worry about keeping the temperature 70 to 80 degrees. It can get real hot or real cold. So, yeah, they're, they're easy. So all those, Pioneer, everything, you know, I believe in all those. OK, so mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that um, <laughs> this is another issue. 
This is what leads us to geocentrism. Because when they send up those probes, okay, they have to calculate how they're going to get that probe to go to Mars, how they're going to get that probe to go to Jupiter. Okay. How are they going to do that? Well, they can't use F equals MA. They, they can use it, but they can't use it alone. You know what they have to do? They have to add in the inertial forces, the, the centrifugal, the Coriolis, and the Euler forces to F equals MA so that they can get that satellite to go where they want it to go. If they don't add in those forces, it will never get there. They don't tell you that, but that's the physics of it. Okay, and you can read this in any physics book. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the centrifugal Coriolis and Euler forces that I told you are generated by a rotating universe. It's all natural. You see, it's all natural. We don't have to make it up and, and say they're fictitious forces, you see. We have to add in these fictitious forces in order to get the satellite to go. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to call them fictitious forces if you were a geocentrist, because they would be real forces. It, one of the moments in the principle, I think, that struck me the most is the spot where you're discussing um, the Michelson-Morley experiment and how you were saying that if it was run on the moon, you would expect a significantly different result because we should, we should detect motion on the moon, but not on the Earth. That's why I was a little bit wondering, how close do you think we are technologically to being able to do an experiment like that? Or do you just have no clue? Well, uh, we already did it. Okay, interesting. <laughs> it's called the GPS. Okay? The GPS mm -hmm. is basically a big Michelson-Morley experiment. Or you could say it's a Sanyak experiment or a Michelson-Gale experiment. But it's the same principle. That is, you're measuring um, wave interference of light beams. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so in the GPS you have these GPS satellites that are in the sky and they have to send signals to one another. Okay. So that everybody knows where everybody is. So when you send an electromagnetic beam from the East uh, GPS to the West GPS. Okay. It goes 50 nanoseconds faster than if you sent the same electromagnetic beam from the West GPS to the East GPS all day every day that happens so you have a discrepancy in the speed of light just like michelson morley found you have a discrepancy in the speed of light not big enough to show that the earth is going around the sun but there is a discrepancy that's Sanyak fa found the same thing there's a discrepancy in the speed of light depending on which direction it's going and michelson gale found the same thing in 1925 you, you not find the same thing if it was run on the earth then no. Well, yeah, you would. Okay. Mm -hmm. But and not to the same degree or? Yeah. I'm but, confused. Yeah. What people don't know is that Michael Samorley did find some difference in the light speeds, but it wasn't enough to, to show that the earth was moving around the sun. See, they needed a discrepancy that, that equated to 30 kilometers per second, because that's the speed of the earth around the sun. But they only got about five kilometers per second, but at least they got something. So the question is, what's causing that something? Okay. Well, and Sanyak got the same percentage, and so did Michelson Gale. So something's going on, that there is some difference between light beam speed, depending on which direction you're going. Okay. Um, so we've already, basically, we've already done that experiment. But you know what they did with it? Here's why whoever spends money to go put the Michelson Morley on the moon is going to lose. Because they know that the GPS should not have that 50 nanosecond difference. But, so what they do is they go in and adjust the computers of the GPS to compensate for that discrepancy. And then they can come out and you say, well, see, light speed is the same, whether it goes east or west. And that just proves the theory of special relativity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, it's all chicanery. They it's subterfuge. They go in there. And we found this out by the guy who works for, he's, he died two years ago. And he was in the movie. His name's Ron Hatch. He was in the principal. And Ron told us that he works for Navcom Technologies. And they have a contract with John Deere Tractor. And Navcom Technologies works so that these tractors can be unmanned. 
and go down straight down the field and make furrows for the crops. Okay. And if the GPS is off, that, that tractor is going to go into the ditch, you see. So those GPS have to be precise. So when Ron went into the GPS to analyze them, he saw why they were precise. Because they, they adjusted the computer to take care of this discrepancy of the 50 nanoseconds between so east and west and west to east, you see. So you're saying so, these crazy geo backwards geocentrists, they're actually helping to build devices that are accurately moving things that involve different science because of geocentrism, almost like us crazy creationists and geocentrists are doing real science against our accusers. <laughs> yeah, well, see, they don't want to believe in the fact that there's a discrepancy in the speed of light. Why? Well, because that'll take them right back to 1905. Because the very reason Einstein invented special relativity was to try to answer all those experiments that were done in the 1800s to show the Earth wasn't moving. Mm. That's why he invented special relativity. So Einstein had two choices. Either I keep the speed of light fixed or I keep the Earth fixed. Which one do you think he's going to choose? He hated Catholicism. He's always complaining about the popes and bishops. His wife, <laughs> his wife became a Catholic. And then they divorced because he wouldn't take care of her. He, this guy was a virtual atheist. So what do you think he's going to choose? Keep the speed of light fixed or keep the earth fixed? Well, mm -hmm. we all know what happened. He kept the speed of light fixed and made the earth move. And that's yeah. what special relativity is all about. So you made some references to relativity. It seems like from what I'm getting from you, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like you generally agree with general relativity, but not special relativity or... Well, you just them this both fully? if I had to convince a man of the world that geocentrism is viable under the rubric of modern science, I'm going to use Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if we have another discussion of whether I really believe Albert was right, well, that's another discussion. OK, fair but enough. I'm, going use, I'm going to use it. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people in the people in the comments were talking a bit about uh Albert Einstein's personal background and uh, yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. bit, a little bit about that. So yeah, there's, I, mean, uh, I don't want to attack the man ad hominem. That's not my purpose. Yeah. I'm just saying, look, you have to admit that a lot of these scientists are motivated because they're atheists. Yeah. And mm -hmm. It's not, I'm not making it up. They've told me this. Okay. This is in Darwin too. I've read quite a bit about Darwin's life. I honestly kind of have a little bit of sympathy for the guy. Um, he yeah. seems like he was a nice guy to hang out with. Um, yeah. But he has this event in his life where his, he was actually almost entered the clergy. It never seemed like he really believed all that much. Um, it was mostly just because the, being an Anglican clergyman, you got a good salary from the government and he could then hang out and just do his scientific research with a free salary and only having to work once a week. Yeah. But he, um... <laughs> Sounds like Anglican clergy today. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to say, yeah, it does seem like he had this, he was still willing to go to church. It seems like his wife cared about going to church, but he has an event where his daughter dies and this really destroys any last, credibility of faith he had and oh, he refused yeah, to go that. to yeah. he even refused to go to wife with his church he was fine with his wife and his kids going to church but he wouldn't go with them anymore yeah yeah and yeah i have to think that it doesn't seem like darwin rejected god because of his scientific research it was because of an event in his life but then you also have to think about how that event in his life is going to cause him to reinterpret the science it's the same thing with in biblical studies bart ehrman i don't know if you know him I've uh, heard of yeah, so mm -hmm. he says that it's the problem of evil. He couldn't figure out how God could have allowed his dad to die. That um, is the real reason he abandoned Christianity. And even though he says that that doesn't play into his New Testament scholarship, it does definitely seem in reality to probably play into how he's interpreting the data when it comes to the New Testament. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't avoid it. And yeah, I remember that, that story about Charles Darwin and his daughter. Mm -hmm. And I said, there it is. There it is. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel I, I, I have compunction for men in general. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for them because it's so hard to get to the truth. I mean, I had to do 20 years of study to get to this geocentric truth. And I'm glad I did. But what about all the other people out there that walk the streets and don't have this information? And they're bombarded day in and day out mm -hmm. with these false theories and everything. And they don't have the acumen to figure it all out. I mean, I, I really feel sorry for them. I really if you, do. 
if you watch my first interview with Matt Frad, because originally he just had me on to discuss my conversion from Eastern Orthodoxy to Catholicism. And he asked me before the show, is there anything you'd like to discuss during the show? And I thought, you know, maybe it'd be good to get some more creationist views out there. So I thought, asked him, oh, I'd like to also touch on evolution at some point during the interview. It'll probably come up in my whole journey of faith anyways. But we get to the end, it hadn't come up, so he'd asked me about it, if I could clarify on that point. And I explained how I'm a young earth creationist. And he looked at me like he had never heard a Catholic say that before. And we get start getting into it and talking about it. And that's a great guy. He's an absolutely yeah, excellent I, guy. Yeah, I know. Um, and yeah, he just sort of started saying, he says, you know, I don't e at this point, I don't even know what I don't know. I don't know what I need to ask the questions to figure out what I need to know. <laughs> and um, I think that's the case with a lot of Catholics here is they haven't even begun it to look at it. And if it wasn't for um, my friend Sarah from Hamilton, who runs a great YouTube channel called Cobain, the Christian, um, when I was Eastern Orthodox, he really helped show me that, no, there actually is good creationist science out there. Yes, maybe what's sort of peddled as sort of the pop apologetics is bad, but there's also real science behind this as well. Yeah. Did you watch that uh, interview that Trent Horn had with Jimmy Aiken after the debate? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy I, I sent that to I me as well. I didn't want to. I saw the first I mean, five minutes of it, and it was like Trent was going to say, okay, you guys can believe in creationism, but here's probably why you don't want to do that. But then I turned it off because I had to go do something else. Did you see the rest of it? And what yeah, I did. Um, it mostly just repeats stuff from the debate. I felt like there wasn't much more to it from there. Um, yeah, I was really hoping maybe – Jimmy would spend that time addressing some of the arguments that he didn't get a chance to, because I went back and you can watch, I did it with Christian and Swan Sona on Swan Sona's channel, intellectual conservatism. And I said, here's the other points Jimmy made during the debate that I felt like I either didn't address or I didn't address well enough. Let me dig into them more. And I was hoping Jimmy would do the same thing on his side. In other, he never addressed any more of my arguments. And yeah, he also you... repeated some misrepresentations in my arguments yeah. on there as well. Um, I do think Trent Horn is a great guy. And I think I think if someone sat down with Trent Horn, I feel like they might be able to convince Trent Horn. He seems like he's a lot more open on this. I don't know. I just it just feels like when I when I when I listen to people like that, it just feels like they're scared. You know, they're they're yeah. they're, they're scared of looking dumb in, in yeah. front of other they, people. So so they so and I mean, I don't mean to psychologize people, but that that's just the impression I get is like, OK, we, we know the creationists look dumb. Like it seems like sacred scripture and tradition and, and the magisterium in the past has taught um, this this doctrine. OK, how, how are we able to get out of it so we don't we're not in that genus of people that look dumb? That, yeah. that, that's what it's it always struck me as. That's why I absolutely hate in watching resources like that's why I didn't watch the Trent Horn and um and Jimmy Aiken uh, debate recap. because so I thought it was basically going to be like that. Like, oh, this will make us look dumb in front of people. And you've yeah, heard stuff they, like that. This will make us look bad in front of the world. This will make they, people not want to convert. Yeah, and that's just one point, absolutely like soteriologically and anthropolog anthropologically ridiculous that that's the reason why they don't want to convert. Yeah, yeah I've heard um, was it, at one point in the interview, in um, the discussion, they mentioned, oh, you know, we think I, I'm willing to say COVID was made in a lab. Like I'm willing to say controversial stuff. John Stewart believes COVID was made in a lab. That isn't controversial anymore. If you, <laughs> if you hold to real controversial views like young earth creationism, geocentrism, integralism, you will quickly know when you talk to people that your views are actually controversial. You know, like all these people going around saying, you know, I think taxation is theft. That's my real controversial view. You can, people be annoyed at you if you say that, but you can articulate that view in a public forum. Yeah. You cannot articulate young earth creationism in a public forum without the entire room immediately not listening to you. Yeah, of course. Well, you know, well, there's, there's a whole different category. There's two kinds of Catholicism alive today, and that is the EWTN Catholic Answers Catholicism. And then the Catholicism that you and I are following, mm -hmm. which gets into the deep roads of Catholicism and doesn't want to maintain the status quo necessarily. But that's what Catholic Answers and EWTN have to do, because that's the legacy they created for themselves to stay in the status quo and not go to the left or the right, but do whatever the Catholic Church is doing at the present time, whether it's good, yeah. bad or indifferent. They're going to follow that. OK, and that's what they do. 
they don't read a lot of people don't read the tradition of the church because I my first thought was okay we're coming to this issue of or does scripture require us to hold a young earth position? My first thought is, okay, what have the church fathers believed? What did the scholastics yes. believe? What did the manuals believe? What have we always believed on this matter? Rather than first stepping back and walking through what do contemporary biblical scholars have to say? Because I think there's yeah. many wonderful things contemporary biblical scholars have offered us. Yeah. I think studies of Second Temple Judaism have really helped enrich our understanding of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, my yeah. computer is running low on battery. I'm going to go look for a charger before it crashes. Yeah, and I, um, and I, and But he was just going to say that that's not the ahead. primary hermeneutic we use. Yeah. I think the 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 even more dangerous part um which which they're saying will look bad in front of in front of the world and stuff i i think from the way in which that crowd that you're talking about the way in which they go about doing theology is not the way in which one should do theology one should do theology by reading the sources of faith and 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 reasoning from there in order to form a coherent system from the sources of faith so sacred scripture the fathers the scholastics it, the way in which you do theology is not just uh look at the the pope's uh latest uh introductory speech to the uh building of a new wing to the science faculty in the vatican that's not how you do theology that, that's that's not how you do it and and that that's just very frustrating to me when I see it done that way because these are honestly very low level uh, magisterial teachings that people a hundred years ago have never would have heard of. They never would have heard that the Pope does a daily homily. They never would have heard that the Pope did a speech in order to build this new wing or or whatever. They would never heard about that. Yeah, we well, have to. Uh, there's one thing. There's your intellectual Catholic, and then there's your average Joe Catholic. You yeah. know, and your average Joe Catholic probably makes up 90% of the church today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these guys, uh, you know, they are what they are. They, you know, they'll pick and choose what they believe based on whatever they like the guy or not. You know, I mean, that mm -hmm. could be the case. So you never know what you're going to get out there. But um, I'm just glad today that there's two sides of the story now because Catholic answers basically ruled the roost about what Catholics were going to believe. And now they're being challenged by a lot of traditional minded people like Gideon and yourself who are coming up in the ranks and seeing things a little bit differently than being spoon fed by Catholic answers. You see, uh, I just wanted to bring up one thing about the debate. And I talked about this last night, but for all the listeners that are out there right now, I just wanted to bring up Pius XII, what he said in his encyclical Humani Generis in 1950 was that, you know, you can believe in evolution if you want, but here's the stumbling block you're going to have to get over in order to do so. And that is you're going to have to explain to us how you can have evolution result only in one ape becoming one man. You see, because the evolutionists believe in this thing called polygenism. Polygenism is the idea that there are millions of apes that turned into men, you see. Yeah. But the church theologically can't allow that. Mm -hmm. And Pope Pius XII said to all his evolution-favoring scholars, until if and when you can find a solution to this doctrinal dilemma, you can't believe in evolution, okay? Because Catholic doctrine doesn't let you. And Raymond Brown, the guy I talked about before, oh, he had a way try, to try to get around that by twisting Pius XII's words, and it didn't work. And so most of your Catholic evolutionists today, like Brown, who teaches at, uh, where, where does that teach? Chicago somewhere? Is he still alive? Yeah, he's still alive. Oh, I didn't even realize he was still alive. I just see him cited. Not, Ray, not Raymond Brown. Oh. No, Brown the evolutionist. Oh, uh, Okay. I forget his first name. Okay, I was thinking, I was like, Raymond Brown, I thought, died a while yeah, ago. Yeah, he died in 1998. That makes more sense. Um, but anyway, so what they do is they say, well, we're just going to reject the, the Pope's teaching against polygenism so we can be Catholic evolutionists. So in other words, they have to disobey the magisterium. Now, wasn't that Jimmy's big point in your debate? That yeah. Gideon, you're not obeying the magisterium. So I, I would just say to Jimmy, Jimmy, you're the one who's not obeying the magisterium. 
Yeah. Because if you accept polygenism, you're going against what Pope Pius XII said. Yeah, I should have probably prepped the magisterium side of stuff more for the debate. But I was saying earlier, I think in this discussion, I expected the debate to be about him trying to interpret biblical passages in other ways, or him trying to bring up certain science, or him trying to argue certain church fathers believed in an old earth. He didn't really address any of those. He addressed the science only a little bit, but refused to even engage with the creationist science, just always saying, oh, that's been debunked over and over. Yeah, or well. it's dismissing. <laughs> and um, anytime anybody just dismisses an argument by that's been disbunked, debunked, don't, don't, don't believe yeah. that. Yeah. And um, well, he, did have, he did have the bite of Jenin argument. Okay. Yeah. That could have been debunked real easy because. We have Vitagelin uh, genin in humans. He didn't. He didn't know that, so that could have been debunked. He also had uh, meteors. However, they because because they what he meant to say was that they analyzed the uranium to lead decay in the meteors, and they can date them. They think okay. So that was another science thing he had. He also had the speed of light from the supernova. Okay, we had. 88 million light years away. How do you explain that? You know, so he did have some science there. Yeah. And, but, uh, but I, I agree with you. He didn't harp on it at all. Yeah. And I was expecting him to really get into the church fathers or scripture. And I was really hoping to have some time to try and push him to give me an exegesis of certain scriptural passages. And I didn't get that at all. The best I got is when I pushed him on second Peter three and he just said that Christ's return wouldn't transfigure anything outside the solar system. Wonder what does that now do to our whole cosmology? We've now thrown out traditional. Co is the whole rest of the universe going to head towards a heat death? Well, just like the solar system, or maybe just the Earth, remains the same. Well, because his whole argument has to be based on mainstream modern science. That's why he gave it to you. Yeah. And he wouldn't go into any scripture or the fathers because he knows he can't win the argument there. Mm -hmm. He thinks that you're crippled when it comes to science. And, and when he dealt with paragraph 283 of the catechism, what did he do? What did he say to you? He said Easy. to you, we, it's the paragraph says, we've been enlightened with great knowledge about the cosmos and all that. Remember that? Paragraph yeah. 283? And okay. He, he just says it doesn't have to do with the, uh, with what, the institute. What did he say yeah. right after that? He goes, and the magisterium isn't looking to creation, the Institute of Creation Research for their science. See, my, my argument there is, I mean, why aren't they? And it's not like the Institute for Creation Research does their own research in a, vacu in a vacuum. All these creationist scientists, they couldn't do most of their work without mainstream science, providing them with a lot of data and resources exactly. and general framework. Yeah. They're very thankful for that, too. I've never heard a creationist scientist say, oh, you know, I really wish all those other mainstream scientists didn't exist. No, they just wish that their work was more accepted and that they could dialogue more with them. Yeah. Yeah, so much for dialogue, huh? Yeah. I mean, some of these guys at Creation Research Institute or ICR or, or wherever, there's like half a dozen of them now. Yeah. Um, they all get their PhDs from the same secular universities that mainstream yeah. science gets theirs. My say, favorite one well, is... Why, well, why isn't Jimmy listening to them? Yeah. My favorite one is Kurt Wise, because Kurt Wise studied under Stephen Jay Gould, and Stephen Jay Gould admitted that Kurt Wise was one of his best students. Well, how is a young earth creationist being said about <laughs> got his PhD at Harvard, one of the top evolutionary biology programs in the world, was said by one of the top evolutionary biologists in the world to be one of his best students. And they're still saying this isn't real science. Yeah. Well, they <laughs> okay. have an agenda. We figured so, out. So we got somebody else asked a question for me, so I'll answer this real quick. Do the reformed scholastic interact, scholastics interact with the issue of heliocentrism? Yeah, just look at what they say about Galileo. If you think <laughs> if you think what Bellarmine said about Galileo was bad, these guys, oh my gosh, they they were like making poems against uh, Galileo. They they had a lot of vitriol for for him. Yeah. The yeah. uh, the uh, Orthodox among them. Then of course, when when all of their strongholds fell in the mid to late seventeenth century, you don't really get much much coming from them anymore. Yeah, guys, excuse me, I have to run into my basement here to turn my water off because it's running. So I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to briefly mention on that that I know the most famous um, Scotist of the 17th century, uh, Bartholomew Mastrius. I came across one thing that apparently he wrote against um, 
heliocentrism as well. It was, I, it, it, was uh, it was very popular for yeah. theologians back then to it, write treatises it, against uh, Galileo. Yeah, I think one of his arguments was the one I brought up earlier that hell is in the center of the universe, and therefore the earth this is in the center of the earth, and therefore the earth has to be in the center of the universe for that cosmology to work out. Um, it's funny, I was just trying to find actually a book by Bartholomew Mastrius in Google Books, and I accidentally came across him being cited in some footnote of some like dumb book about how like Catholics are stupid because we defended geocentrism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the other Paul, he asks, what are the best nitty gritty scientific resources for taking the geocentrism pill, which is... Of agreeing with geocentrism and which deals with the most cutting edge mainstream science against such. Well, there's a lot of books out there today. Um, I have all of them on my bookshelf back here. Um, if you want to go to the ones I've written, I've probably written what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight books on this subject from the really in-depth treatment to the what I call the dumb ski treatment and everywhere in between. So um, my, my website is robertsongenis.org and you can go there and find different ones. And I think the one I would suggest you start with is Geocentrism 101. And then there's another book alongside of that. So even simpler called Geocentrism for dumb skis. So those two, I think, is where I would recommend you start. For the other Paul, that one would be perfect. <laughs> Could you possibly maybe put together like a short reading list, like maybe introductory, intermediate, and like expert? Maybe we could put we could put the comments or something like that. Sure can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, 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 speaking of books, you speaking of books you've written. As I was preparing for the jimmy aiken debate i was told you have written a book on the first four days of creation that i was told was really excellent so i was yeah. curious if you could talk about that maybe well that's the ninth book i read i forgot about that one um yeah um that's available robertsongenis.org uh, hardback paperback pdf whatever you want it's all available there yeah we're actually making a movie with the colby center and there you go. i can put myself in the center if you want to try to I think all right so yeah, these are these are mirrored which always throws me off okay yeah i accidentally, <laughs> actually so, clicked the other button so i am um, um making a movie another movie with the colby center called how the world was created in six days and we go through a very literal interpretation of genesis one and two to show that how, how that is and that is an offshoot of the book that you just mentioned the fir first four days of creation but now we're expanding it to include all six days plus the seventh day. And it's going to be about a two, two hour movie. Yeah, that, that'll be really awesome. I'll definitely, do you know, have any clue when that's coming out or is it still a long way in the making? Well, it's a long way in the making because no, uh, let me, let me take that back. It would have been issued already because um, I wanted it to move fast, but my producer is having some difficulty both personally and um, mechanically, because he's lot, has some other project that he's been working on and has to get that done. So that's slowing it down a little bit. So what we decided to do was we're gonna let, let out one day at a time. Uh, so for, for one month, we're gonna put out the first day. Second month, we're gonna put out the second day. Third month, third day, until we get to the seventh. And then after they're all done, we'll put it in one DVD so that you can purchase it like like that. So we're going to have it available for downloading, streaming, and we may have each day put on a DVD. I don't know. We haven't come to that part yet, but um, that's how we figured it would be the best way to get out. Yeah, that'll be really awesome. I look forward to that for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. What was it specific about the first four days, may I ask, that made you focus on them? Is that was it related to your cosmology work with geocentrism? or? Yeah, and that's where the most of the controversy is on the geocentric end and the cosmology end, and the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff. After you get through that, the fourth day, um, then you have you know the birds and the fish and then man and animals made. And that deals more with the evolutionary side. Okay. Um, so what we did basically with those days, uh, that is five, six, 
five and six was make sure we answered all the objections that are foisted upon the creation of the animals and the plants and all that. You know how they, they try to use Genesis two to say that contradicts Genesis one about the plants, you know, they mm -hmm. has Noah, or I'm sorry, Adam uh, cultivating the plants. And before that Adam is created. So how can Genesis one say that the plants are created and then man's created on the sixth day? It seems reverse, you see. So we yeah. have all kinds of objections dealing with uh, days five and six, but with days yeah. one to four, we're dealing with all the cosmological issues. Uh, and we show, yeah. you know, why the Big Bang is wrong and why the earth was made first and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Can, can I ask also some of your thoughts perhaps on um, some of these Protestant creationist attempts to account for like starlight problem and a young earth cosmology. The two I know of are Russell Humphrey's view of this white hole dilation, I think he calls it. And then the other one I've heard of is Jason Lisley's view that um, basically there's, there's, what is it? Jason Lyle. Lyle, thank you. Um, based on different directions of the speed of light. So I'm just curious what the, your, thoughts are on those two theories well i'll be both, back in one second okay mm -hmm. they're both using general relativity mm -hmm. and um so general relativity can be manipulated very easily to support any kind of deviation in light speed or time and so that's basically what they do they're juggling these two variables to try to make it fit into genesis okay the problem i see with them is most of them conflate day one with day four they're mm -hmm. trying to show that the light is either the sun or some pre-sun or something associated with it like hugh ross for example says that when he says the light was created it really means the sun was created but we didn't see the sun until the fourth day when the clouds were taken away and then we can see yeah. the starlight. i mean you Hugh Ross, <laughs> Hugh Ross is a terrible biblical exegete. Like I, I remember encountering his stuff early on when I was trying to decide between old earth and young earth. And I quickly realized his whole hypothesis for the garden of Eden doesn't work because it's at the bottom of where the four rivers meet. And very clearly Genesis says the four rivers came out of one source. Yeah, and also good. he still thinks that humans split up when we were in like a caveman era. Yeah. Well, Genesis 11, it says they baked bricks. Did cavemen people bake bricks? And then how did they forget this technology? Now, yeah. I would argue that cave, the cavemen were digging up. They're still post Babel. But probably what happened is, I mean, if everyone's living in a city, all their technology is based around knowing what's city life. I mean, if we all tomorrow, if we had an apocalypse and we lost everything, I don't know how to like hunt my food. I can barely hunt food, you know? I wouldn't know, I, I wouldn't bother to spend any time trying to write theology, you know, if we had the apocalypse tomorrow. Yeah. And I think that that's probably how it was for most things is all that technology was lost in a dark age after Babel. But I'm also not committed to the humans were finding, I'm not committed to the secular timeline for how we're dating these fossils. And he's really committed to that secular timeline of how we're dating these. And so the different things he wants to add into his explanation just don't add up in context. Are you, are you familiar with the work of uh, Stephen Austin and Guy Berteau on the fossil uh, formation? I, I'm familiar with Steve Austin. I don't know the other person you just mentioned, but he, I've probably read work that was done by him. If I've read stuff by Steve Austin. Guy Berteau, um, He's in France, and he basically did the next step of where Stephen Austin and some of these mm -hmm. other guys had led the, the investigations. And basically what he found was by experimental evidence using flumes and water and soil and all that, and then digging uh, in beaches for and examining the soil. So it's all empirical. It's not just mm -hmm. made up in his head. Um, he came to the conclusion that the geologic uh, column was created both by vertical and horizontal sediment yeah. uh, 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 layers. Okay, and once you do, once you incorporate the vertical and the horizontal together, it can be very rapid. It doesn't have to wait for one horizontal layer to be finished for the next one to be yeah. put on. I was reading in preparation for the debate. I was rereading uh, Leonard Brand's excellent book, um, Faith 
um, reason and earth history or something like that. It's actually, he, it says basically his textbook he wrote as an introduction to creationism. And it's actually totally free on Kindle. He put really nice. He put that out there. And I was reading his explanation of how the layers were formed. And he was suggesting especially turbidity currents as a possibility. And I actually looked up how they're formed. You can actually watch videos of yeah. them in labs recreating turbidity currents. And it's really fascinating watching yeah. just how quickly a layer of rocks can form. If you watch these, it's a giant layer of dirt just moving in, settling in rapidly. Well, this could easily wipe out like a continent sized area if you had a, if you had a worldwide flood and move that like the distance of a continent, lay it all down. And what something that I harked on with Jimmy Aiken never responded to about the science is in layers that all these creationist scientists are for, say are formed by the flood. We have like continent sized areas that were clearly laid down in one singular motion. And this is because Leonard Brandt and some of his students have measured the paleo currents at many different sites around the world and have shown these are continent sized areas that were laid down at once. And He's published his research on this in Nature magazine. This is not some out there creationist magazine. This is like the most mainstream journal you can possibly get. Yeah. Of course, he doesn't draw the creationist conclusions. He just talks about all the paleo current data he's collected. It yeah, just well, sort of leaves it out there. But a lot of these guys do the experimentation and thinking for us, the sort of pre-thinking. And then we just jump on what they have produced and show mm -hmm. how it fits into the creation yeah, model. It, you know? And Brand, Brand himself is a creationist, so he's just putting this out there. He knows his students are going to draw the right conclusion, but he knows he can't publish it ex, ex, uh, in nature unless he's not willing to draw that. And he was also looking at the burial of a whale fossil and trying to argue this was formed by the flood. And he suggested it was a very, very local flood in the paper he submitted to um, Geology, another ma major mainstream journal, it's suggesting, oh, they're not going to buy it. They're going to Google me and find my creationist credentials, and not, they're not going to publish me if I suggest anything like a giant flood. And he actually got back from a peer reviewer saying, actually, the data you're suggesting here would only fit with a very, very large flood. <laughs> so you better go back and revise that. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how all that information seeps to the surface, you know. Yeah. You never know when it's going to come out. I have a uh, PhD in nuclear physics mm -hmm. friend of mine in Croatia, and um, he read my books on geocentrism and was convinced that it was correct. And he wrote a, uh, a paper using Machian physics to explain how geocentrism works, and it was accepted by the European Journal of Physics. And that was in what 2013, and then and then um, I said, well, maybe you can do a little bit more. Maybe, you know, let's show a little bit more about it. And he did in the second paper, but then the referee, the censor, saw that it was leaning towards geocentrism and wouldn't let him publish <laughs> it. Right? Yeah. So he got the sting, and and so whenever I contact him now about doing something for geocentrism, he's He's always cautious now yeah, because he has this prestigious job in Croatia as a nuclear physicist and doesn't want to lose it. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize, I think peer review is this perfect process, but I mean, the peer reviewers are other humans sitting on the other side and they're liable to all the same biases or mistakes as other humans. Oh yeah. There's a great documentary I watched recently about this guy working in, um, physics in the early 2000s for Bell Labs, and he actually possibly almost won um, the Nobel Prize for his work. Turns out 100% of his papers were all forgeries, and they caught him eventually because he was becoming so famous that he got so lazy and caught up in his own fame that he started publishing the same forged graphs with the exact same noise within the graph and just changing the labels on them. And somebody eventually caught him on that when they were reading multiple of his articles. Yeah. And, and they started going back and realizing that he would, within 10 days, publish a paper that if he spent every waking minute doing the experiments he was describing and could do them faster than any other person ever, it would still take multiple years of nonstop work to have done this paper that he supposedly did in 10 days. Yeah. And it was just incredibly sloppy stuff like that. You have to wonder how many other people get away because they're a little less sloppy or just no one, ha they're not as famous, so no one catches them. Yeah, I have a whole um, chapter in my book, Galileo was wrong about the chicanery and subterfuge that goes on in science today. Mm -hmm. you, may, you have, see, because they have this image of the man in the white lab coat is completely honest, the total opposite of a used car salesman. 
and you can believe everything he's saying because he's totally objective, you see. But that that is just not the case when you go out and examine uh, what's really happening in modern academia and in the laboratories today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I came up with all kinds of evidence and it just like turned my stomach, you know, that these guys could act this way. Going back to the uh, the, the water, um, who, who was the guy you were saying did the- uh, Look, Leonard Brands. Okay. Well, he's doing the same thing that this guy, Guy Berteau. Was yeah. Doing. Because that's that's what a flume is. Yeah. You set you send the water down the flume with all these granules. Okay. Yeah. And the heavy ones will go down first, and the medium ones, and then the light yeah. ones, and then it'll start over again. Yeah. It'll put the it'll put the heavy ones on the light ones, and then the medium, and then the light, and then the heavy, medium, light, until it forms this pattern, which is a geologic column. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, Leonard Brand um, <coughs> is a Seventh Day Adventist, so he's been a little bit probably more removed from probably the more sort of mainstream within creationism, creationist research. Uh, but there has seemed to be better dialogue in recent years. Was one of his students, um, Art Chadwick, who he's done a lot of work with, appeared, for example, in the Is Genesis History documentary, which that was such a wonderful documentary where I think it really brought together the best people and contemporary creationist science and let them that's unfortunate they each got like five minutes to explain their views mm -hmm. but if you go on their youtube channel they have like hundreds of hours of interviews with these people that they've now all put up online you can go into interesting when my um my uh, son was in eighth grade he had to do a science experiment and i was just getting into geeper toe and all the geologic column and i said hey mm -hmm. here's one we could do because i saw somebody else do it and i wanted to see if i could replicate it and what we did is, and I have a picture of it somewhere. I don't know if I can find it. But anyway, we we built a plastic, clear plastic triangle shaped container that was very thin. In other words, you could put a little bit of stuff into it and you could see what's going on when you looked at the outside because it was mm -hmm. clear. Okay. So what we did was we, we made this triangle and then we put a hole at the top here. Okay. And we got three different um, sizes of grains. We got heavy, we got big ones like you know about that big, and then small little smaller ones, and then the smallest. So we had three different grain sizes. We mixed it all up, and then we poured it through the top of the triangle here. Okay. Yeah. I poured it through the top of the triangle. Look, there we go. And guess what happened? So as the, they're, they're the, forming the call, they're forming the different layers, forming different layers, heavy, medium, light, heavy, medium, light. I couldn't believe seeing it with my own yeah. eyes. Yeah, the, no, there's a right. um. And, but wait, wait a minute. He took it to yeah, sorry, yeah. He took it to his science uh, fair experiment, and um, everybody looked at it and said, "What's that?" You know, like nobody had a clue what he was doing. Yeah, <laughs> it was too way over their heads. But it was something I'll never forget when I saw that forming in that triangle. It was just amazing. Anyway, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, I was going to mention um, some of the people who worked on Is Genesis History. They partnered with another company, Compass Classroom, which is a company trying to provide resources to homeschooling creationist families. And um, they're just working on creating a new course. Unfortunately, there's not much information about it. I almost want to enroll as like an adult on it so I can get more information. But looking at um, creationist science, and it looks like part of it is you actually have to do experiments recreating certain creationist things, probably similar to some of the stuff you're describing. And I think it's designed for high schoolers so that they will actually do, hopefully, possibly even contribute new research to creationism and, and also just learning these creationist models. Because part of the problem is there's no resources out there to, for, to teach this to kids. I encounter this problem working in schools. I like talk to um, a number of my coworkers and they're very sympathetic to my views. I don't happen to teach the science class. Um, but I could easily see if they wanted to try and introduce some of this stuff to the science class, there's often not very good resources out there. And I think one of the big next steps that has to be done now that we've done a lot of the good research is to present this research to young people so that they can learn. Because I don't think we realize how much of our views are formed when we're young. I don't think this has to be propaganda. We're just 
just like the evolutionists present them with evolution, we should present them with creationism. And just like they present them with real evolutionary science, we should present them with real creationist science. You got that right. Yeah, Raymond Brown, he says, when, when you're teaching children about the Bible, all you want to do is read the first verse of Genesis 1 and then close the book. And if, you, and if he insists on reading the rest of it, you just tell him, well, that's just myth and legend. You don't have yeah. to. <laughs> I, I, I just over the course of this year, and I'm at a very, very traditional Catholic school. I'll talk with the kids about certain Catholic teachings and they just simply never knew. And I know their parents, their parents are very good Catholics, but a lot of them simply don't know what to teach the kids. And so I'm teaching them even basic things like um, we're going to talk about transubstantiation. I was talking about substance accident distinction and they had simply never heard of this before. Well, it's because we've never presented them with the teachings of the Catholic church on so many different things. Um, and uh, I think it's, you teach uh, five, uh, fifth grade and sixth grade. I uh, seventh and eighth grade mostly, but I teach a little grade. bit of ninth grade. And then I also tutor kids from everywhere from like fourth grade to like 10th grade. So, okay. So when I send you these two books, geocentrism 101 and yeah. geocentrism, I want you to, to look through them and tell me if your students would would consider them like a good school material for their level of intellect and uh, their yeah. experience and let me know because yeah, i maybe can I'll... transform them into uh homeschooling stuff or oh, that, that would be excellent i'd love to work with you on that yeah i might throw it in um over to one of my um tutoring kids because that's easier to do than but for example in my um what was it class where in my English class, we're going through, as mentioned earlier, that poem from Shakespeare that actually it really is predicated upon traditional views of cosmology and geocentrism or else Lorenzo's whole argument of why Jessica shouldn't be worried doesn't work. And I just sort of presented the traditional Ptolemaic view of astronomy to them about the um, sublunary and superlunary zones and just sort of explaining the worldview of the people who wrote this poem because I hated Shakespeare when I was in school because I didn't know the worldview of Shakespeare at all. I knew nothing about the medieval world. And now having spent, I was a double major in classics and um, medieval studies. So I got a lot of this background in college and then going in now and rereading Shakespeare, I'm like, oh, now I actually understand what in the world he's talking about. <laughs> and I'm able to present that material. So, yeah, I think it would be really wonderful if we could have better resources. There's a great book. I want to pitch this again to people called Fossils in the Flood by Paul Garner. This book just came out recently. Paul Garner is a creationist geologist, and he worked on the text of this book with a whole bunch of other creationist scientists. And he worked with a woman at his church who does illustrations and did lots and lots of illustrations. So you can see, for example, here's what part of the pre-flood world looked like. And he goes in and labels the different things he talks about. He has a whole section on fossils where he talks about how do we know this material. He has a section, one of my favorite sections in this book is this page where he tries to explain how the floodwaters successively buried different layers of sediment here. In the actual text of this, this is like quite complex science within the actual text, but then he has all those images. So this is a book that kids can love because they'll just look at the pictures and read a little bit of the material and fall in love with the science. I learned new stuff reading this. Lots of, I'm sure real scientists could learn new stuff reading this. This is a really, really wonderful book I recommend. It's Fossils in the Flood by Paul Garner. All right, you have to, written down. Yeah, Paul you can Garner. buy it direct from the Is Genesis History website. Um, it's marked up a whole bunch on Amazon. If you just buy it direct from them, it's a lot cheaper. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to go in a few minutes, but we have one more question in the chat that I'm sure everybody i've heard this from multiple people asking this question so question we would all love to see a debate between aiken and some genus gideon was money but as far as debate tactics and techniques and genus could give aiken a run for his money how about it oh, you ever considered more, that i can do i can do more than give him a run for his money <laughs> 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 um uh, i think gideon did an excellent job thank um, you the time factor is and the, the way that Jimmy was steering the debate toward the magisterium 
just I, I think it got Gideon off his track. Yeah. But if you had to prepare for that, knowing that that was coming, I think you do an excellent yeah. job. If I were to debate this again, I would debate it with a traditionalist who is going to accept the authority of the fathers. I'd be happy to debate any sort of traditionalist or anyone who's going to accept that we you can't mean, immediately dismiss Catholic? the text of scripture. Yeah, what? but let me say this. For yeah, I could do that, someone on there. I but think yeah. That's good. Yeah, I think that's the direction you need to mm -hmm. go in, and I hope you do it. Um, Jimmy Aiken, anytime, anywhere, is what I say. Right. So if anybody I'll, out there wants I'll, to contact him, and I'll let him know. Yeah. Okay. We'll have. Well, I'm sure this will be. This seems like there's a lot of engagement in the live chat. So this will be a few hundred viewers on this one. So uh, if any of the few hundred of you out there would like to uh, like to get that set up, I'd love to love to help uh, any way I can getting that getting that uh, yeah. together. So that's all all I have for you. I gotta get going soon as I said. Any any last words from from either of you two? This has been very interesting. Gideon, I'm just so happy that a guy of your age and intellect has taken this mantle up. And I just hope you continue. You have every support from me that you could possibly have in any way I can help you. Let me know. But but God's blessing on you, brother. I just hope Thank you keep on going and try to get many more to do it. Thank you. That really means a lot coming from you. I think you're, um, I've really admired your work and yeah, I've always wanted to dig deeper into the geocentrism issue and I've always leaned towards it, but I just hadn't looked into it as much. There's just so much time in the day, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to bring you perhaps maybe on my channel sometime for my patrons. I usually do more in-depth interviews and I like to grab stuff that you can't sort of get anywhere. So maybe I could bring you on and you could do a in-depth presentation of some sort of issue. Maybe it's one aspect of the science here. I'd love to do that. No problem. Love to do it for you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you both. This has yeah, thank been, you. as I said, great. Both of you uh, know a lot more than me about this. I'm a, as, as James White says, I'm a, I'm a, he, he said, I'm a dogmatician, not a historian. Well, here <laughs> I'm a, I'm a dogmatician, not a scientist. So uh, <laughs> this has been great. Thank you both. And okay. um, I would love to eventually set up an, another one of these, because I, I think, this uh, this conversation has went on for two and a half hours, so obviously um, yeah. th we have a lot more to talk we have, about. We have so aspects. much more, yeah. Oh yeah, this could have went on forever if I wouldn't have stopped you. Too. Yeah, <laughs> this is the reason I hadn't touched young Earth creationism for so long, is I wanted to make a series, a sort of documentary series on my YouTube channel about it. And the more I thought about, it, I was like, this is going to get to like ten hours. Like I have no time right now to put together such a series. <laughs> and um, I still want to do that one of these days, and hopefully I'll get to do that. But Great. Good. Okay. More power to you. Thank okay. you, Christian. Appreciate Thank it so you. much. Take yep. care. See you. Bye-bye.